just telling you. Recording in progress. Hey, good evening. This is a work session of the Greenbelt City Council. My name is Emmett Jordan. I serve as uh, mayor um, here at the table with my colleagues. Could you introduce yourselves, please? Kristen Weaver, Mayor Pro Tem. Jenny Pompey, Council Member. Danielle McKinney, Council Member. Silky Pope, Council Member. Amy Niesel, Council Member. Rodney Roberts, City Council. Okay, City Council, uh, are there any information items for the uh, the tail end of the meeting? I have two. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, City Manager Sumron, how are you tonight? I'm doing great. Thank oh. you. We had a great event today, so I'm happy. You sure did. Hey, do you have any information items for the uh, end of the meeting? Okay, okay. Uh, so this is a work session. It's actually a budget work session. We we received the uh, city manager's proposal for the uh, 2025 uh, budget. Oh, I guess it's been about three or four weeks now. Time sure does fly. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is uh, council's responsibility to, to actually uh, go through the budget proposal and to, uh, to see exactly what is in the plan uh, for the next year. And this budget really is the working document that guides the, uh, the operations of the city of Greenbelt. So it's, it's uh, very important and it also gives us a chance to, to you know, kind of talk about things in a, in a broader way so that the general public can get a good understanding of how the various departments and functions uh, go on day to day in the city of Greenbelt. So we'll be covering a couple of uh, areas. We'll be talking with Greenbelt Cares. We'll be talking with the uh, Greenbelt Cinema as well. So before we get started, let me just make this brief statement. We do hold council work sessions on Mondays and Wednesdays several times a month uh, to exchange information with the community stakeholders or to gather information from staff, uh, advisory boards or residents. No votes or formal actions are taken at work sessions. And our work sessions and meetings are always open to the public except for executive sessions as authorized by state law so that residents and others can observe council's deliberations. We do strive to provide a reasonable opportunity for the public to voice opinions on matters being considered and we'll pause periodically for public comment, probably every 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, let's see, uh, during these times, if you do wish to address council or ask a question or a question of uh, the city administration, if you, if you raise your hand, if you're in the room, uh, after we recognize you, you can go to the podium and you need to state your name and where you live in Greenbelt, more or less, for our minutes. If you are online on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab to submit a question or you can raise your virtual hand and once again, we'll, we'll promote you and recognize you so that you can speak. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or the city's cable TV channel, you can certainly send an email to us at, green, at council questions at greenbeltmd.gov. Uh, that's a lot of things for us to, uh, to follow, so we'll do our best to, uh, to pick up on your question. So just in general, you know, if, if we do ask you to, to keep your comments to three to five minutes and speak on one topic, please. Uh, related to the question under consideration, and uh, please uh, avoid questioning the motives of others. And in general, uh, we all want to be civil in our uh, discussions. Um, you know, we're all neighbors here in Greenbelt, and it's just important that we be respectful uh, of one another. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and plunge into the discussion. Uh, City Manager Sumron, I, I think we'll start off with uh, Greenbelt Cares, since they're sitting at the table in front of us. Do you want to introduce everybody who's here? Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, joining me today is the city treasurer, Ms. Uh, Bertha Gaiman, and uh, for our CARES director, Liz Park, and uh, Katie, uh, sorry, Crystal Beatty. <laughs> I combined the two. Yeah. Crystal Beatty, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. So in the uh, budget book, which, which is online, you can download a copy of the budget it's, uh, there's a link on the city's uh, communications page. It's a large document, but it's compressed, so you can, uh, you can download it. And it's a PDF uh, document. So the first, we're gonna go to the first section of the budget document to just take a, get an overview of Greenbelt Cares. Our social services department 
You know, we, we had a visit uh, this morning from the National League of Cities. It's their 100th anniversary, and we were actually talking a little bit about the, the very special programs that we have here in Greenbelt. And we didn't get a chance to really talk about Greenbelt Cares and the social service programs that we have here. And I think, you know, in Prince George's County and throughout the state of Maryland, and in fact, uh, around the country, I think some of the, uh, the services that we provide, given the size of the city of Greenbelt, it's quite a commitment that uh, council and the city manager make through the budget. So we're fortunate to have excellent, uh, really strong people working for us at the city of Greenbelt who have been here for quite some time. So let's just go ahead and start off at the uh, first page, which is 280, what's that first page? 186, 185. And on the agenda that we printed, we had said that we were going to talk about uh, the grants and contributions, and we're actually going to defer that to a later conversation. I think May the 4th is what we just the said. Sixth. May the 6th. So if you are following online, we're going to go to page 186, 185. And if we can, oh, there it is. It's up there on the screen. Whoa. So efficient. So, Dr. Park, how long have you been with the city of Greenbelt? I have been with the city of Greenbelt a little bit over 20 years. So that's uh, very, very impressive. Where were you before you came to Greenbelt? Before I came to Greenbelt, I have to think back now. Um, I was down at Tri-County Youth Services down in the Waldorf area. Huh? Really, really fortunate to have you here. So in the budget book, there's, there's like an overview of each department. And uh, so initially, there's in the cover page. Do you want to just kind of walk us through the first couple of pages? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, so on this first page, you see um, just an overview of Greenbelt Cares. We have the Youth and Family Services Bureau. We have the Gale Program, the Greenbelt Assistance Living Program and then also the service coordinator program over at Greenridge House. And so you see that the main categories of services that we provide are mental health services, education and workforce services, senior services, and then community services. So we really try and um, reach out to the community and make sure um, that we're healthy, not just in um, roads and recreation, but mental health and helping people live as healthy as possible. So whether that's getting jobs or through educational programs, Crystal and her team offer a lot of workshops to help caregivers understand and um, connect with each other. Um, we offer um, anger management classes. Um, we offer ESOL classes, GED classes, tutoring services. So just trying to help people um, be successful in their lives. Really powerful. So just in terms, if you go to page 187, uh, there's a discussion about staffing. So the services that you've just, just described are available for all Greenbelters. So uh, a lot of the services are right here in the municipal building. Some of them, some of the group uh, sessions actually take place in this room, but also there are an array of services that are available in the Spring Hill Lake uh, neighborhood right. uh, in Franklin Park in our recreation center that we have there. Exactly, yep. Right. So let's see. So uh, in terms of youth and family services, uh, how many people do we have uh, working for the city? Um, so f right now um, it's budgeted um, for 2024 at 17.1 positions, um, but then in FY25 it would be 16.6 .6, um, due to some decrease with the ARPA positions going away. Right. So we've had to, to shift a little bit. We, we ramped things up over the past three years, really putting more of a focus on uh, helping people with emergency assistance, with food distribution and uh, just crisis uh, counseling and whatnot. So as that, that funding is dwindling, there's a real infusion of help from the federal government. We're sort of adapting, but we're not really uh, the intention. Your intention is not really to cut services, but is more to sort of absorb some of the uh, the personnel and, uh, you know, some part-time people converting and merging some of the, uh, the full-time uh, positions so that it is actually more than what we were putting into uh, the youth service and family service and CARES 
before, but it's not quite as much as we're able to fund uh, in the past With the two years. dollars, right. You know? So that's the uh, personnel side of things. Do you want to talk about that in, in greater detail? No, so I would only say that only um, besides the ARPA positions that may be changing, as noted in the budget item, um, in this budget, um, we would be promoting uh, Ms. Beatty to assistant director, something she has um, well deserved for many, many years. She really oversees the Gale program and has grown it from a one person shop, shop, which was Crystal 20 years ago, okay. um, to now a full fledged department um, that offers a variety of services. So really, I'm thrilled to be able to make her an assistant director because she really functions as a, an assistant director. Um, and so really happy that we were able to include that um, in this budget. And then bringing on um, the bilingual community health case worker um, who was, was formerly ARPA funded, but this budget will fund her as a city position or fund that position because we really are working to right, reach out to our Spanish speaking families, our bilingual families, and we don't want to bring back that level of service there. Um, the emergency case managers who were funded by ARPA were really focused on the rental assistance, the scholarships, the workforce development scholarships. So they understood that as those ARPA dollars went away, those positions would go away. Um, and so we anticipated that those positions would be closing as those dollars because we won't have applications to process and those types of things. But we love our staff, and so we are working with them to find other positions. So whether it's within our city or other cities, I, um, I wouldn't want to leave them um, good employees not working somewhere. So um, don't think that we're just putting people aside. We um, are working to help find them positions elsewhere. Um, Let's pivot uh, to page 185, if you can put that up. That's the organizational chart. So, you know, during COVID, uh, there, there was quite a, a backup in trying just to, to help people with the uh, request for emergency assistance. And at one point, we were pretty far, we were a little bit backed up. The county, very, was, very beginning, the county yes. was much more backed yes, up. Yeah. But we, we were able to address people's needs mm -hmm. as best we could. Yes. So uh, any other, just in terms of the organizational chart, uh, having Ms. Beatty as the assistant director, any other uh, big changes? I would say the only other change is the senior mental health provider um, will be, um, again, part of her position is now ARPA funded. Part of it is grant funded through other grants that we have. And so she'll be going from full time to part time. Um, and so we won't have the same level of service of somebody just dedicated to working with seniors um, as we're able to have right now. Um, but again, we have to understand how far ARPA funds would go. And Chris and I certainly will be looking for other ways to um, fund that with other grants and things like that, because we know it's a needed service um, in the community. We have kept um, that person more than busy, <laughs> especially during COVID. Many seniors were isolated and um, developed anxieties or depressions or other issues. And so we're really seeing that and wanting to make sure that we help them with their needs and um, you know respond as quickly as possible. Hey, so with the ARPA funding, we, we still have a uh, tranche of uh, funding left, especially for uh, workforce development and uh, more educational and workforce development uh, grants. So we're about halfway, well, it's a third of the way through the year. So we'll, we, we will continue to, to have enough staff to, to actually process uh, yes. the rest of the funding that's coming through. Right, it's the person going to run is out. still there now. Right. It's just that... Um, by December, that position will be gone because the grants will have to have been spent by then. Okay. Uh, any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I just uh, was because it, 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 there were a few different um, names for positions that I weren't sure if they're the same because there's the memo that talks about the community health coordinator, but I think somewhere else it talks about the community health caseworker. Is that the, those are those are different? Okay. Right. And on here, I see they call him a community case manager. So. There is some confusion. I think you're right. The community health worker is um, a nurse that we've hired with ARPA dollars to help run the nursing programs and has helped expand that. Um, but with ARPA dollars going away, again, we won't be able to continue that position. So we're going to have to shrink back some of our um, nursing programs out in the community, unfortunately. And that's the community health coordinator yes. position. Yes. But the other one that's labeled of community health caseworker is the, is 
that's the, is that the same as the one that's here lace, labeled as community case manager? On the, on, on, the the, on the chart? Yes. Okay. And one more question on the chart. Uh, you know, I think uh, something that has been in place for quite some time is working with uh, volunteers and interns. And uh, it's a way for, uh, by working with uh, the University of Maryland and Catholic University and bringing in uh, graduate students and whatnot to perform services uh, under close supervision, it gives them a chance to gain greater experience while it, it's a real ass, asset to, uh, to Greenbelt. So are you, will you be able to, are you expanding the number of uh, volunteers that you are managing? I know the, the uh, students from Catholic University, that's, that's a relatively new program that's just been in place for, what, a year and a half? That's with the community nursing program. Yeah. So we have a capacity for so many interns, and that really hasn't changed throughout time just because interns then have to be supervised and we have to, you know, have um, staff able to do that. So we won't really be able to expand in terms of intern positions. We're providing direct service. Um, but Crystal's always looking for volunteers to help with, like, food distribution um, and other programs like that. One of the other things I think that's pertinent is with the reduction in the community health coordinator position, the nurse position, we will be reducing the number of interns that we see through the community nursing program just because of the sheer um, volume <coughs> of students. We had a partnership with five schools of nursing. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Bless you. <coughs> and we had approximately 38. We started with six interns. We went up to 38. Um, and then at its peak, we had 59 nurses. Whoa, that is, that's a... That's a lot of uh, human resource, uh, uh, just being able to, to bring that and supervise that many people. It's, it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. So that I think that is one of the examples of we're going to be cutting back with the ARPA dollars ending. We're going to be incorporating some of that into existing employees' positions to manage, uh, therefore reducing the number of seniors and uh, adults with disabilities that we can serve because we have less students that we can accommodate in the community nursing program. That also covers our bilingual pediatric program as well. So there'll be reductions on both sides of that. It's unfortunate, but having 59 interns, is, that's just really powerful. Yeah. Just in terms of the ability to provide services. Amir Patel. Um, are, are, there, are there possibly grants that we could, we, we could continue that? And about, do you have an estimate of how much funding it would take to continue that position? <laughs> well, we had talked, to, it's only two days a week. It's Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's currently funded until December. So not including FICA. We're looking at about $20,000 from January to um, June. So about 40000 40, a year. 40000 a year. Okay. That's not, that doesn't seem, it seems like that's not a lot of money. Like, I wish we could find something, something to cover that. Right. right. So, Liz and I are, are grant Searching, yeah. Hands, <laughs> looking huh. for funding always. So if you know of something, please bring it to our attention. Yeah. You betcha. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and keep rolling oh, through the book. Miss, I'm sorry, uh, Miss. Quick question, um, and I know it's not ex ex exactly the same, but I know that um, our community hospital down the street, Lumens, is is expanding its what is it? It's OBGYN session. So I'm just wondering if there had been a conversation or maybe around partnerships since they're expanding their services that maybe we could work with them on to look at potentially interns or anything like that. I don't know if that has been explored or not. So we haven't talked with Luminous just because the schools of nursing um, so interns might go to Luminous but Luminous themselves likely don't have interns to go out into the community because they're not a school. Um, but shared resources, <laughs> what I'm wondering, like if they had interns or people that are going through nursing school that are working at the hospital itself, could there be a shared partnership? Right, and I guess, right, whether whether they would offer a community nursing option like we do. So I don't know, that's what we could ask. And I know Crystal works with Luminous in terms of our health fairs. Um, and doing the flu shots and those kinds of programs. But um, so we could ask, I'm not sure um, what their capacity is. Yep. 
I know that there was a lot of talk about one program, a doula program to help uh, uh, with OBGYN to, to help uh, women bring bring uh, babies into the world. Are you familiar with that? Sure, uh, you know? doula. Uh -huh. I also have the death doula in the different ends of the yeah. spectrum here as yeah. far as the death doula program, but we do not have, um, we have speakers uh -huh. that come to speak on that subject, the death doula side, not the doula on the um, birthing, birthing side. side. Okay. But right. We so we often then um, will work with Mary's Center or, um, and their name is going out of my head right there in College Park. There's another um, center right there that um, works with um, and CCI, CCI uh, yes. around um, birthing issues and around um, pregnancy health. Okay. Hey, let's keep moving through the book and also with the uh, memo. Yes, go ahead, Just Council Member. Question. Um, under the uh, Green Battle Assistance in Living, you talk about um, number of seniors served, number of non-seniors served, and that these numbers don't reflect individuals served at large events, such as the produce and nutrition events. Does that mean like the <coughs> the monthly produce giveaways? Is that what that's referring to? I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> because we're in the process of putting together a report for council that reflects from the new... Um, if you're not familiar, we currently have produce cards that get scanned. Um, and, that, and that is one of the... Um, ways that we are now able to collect more accurate data. So we're in the process, and we should have it finished in the next week, a report that analyzes from the beginning of that program, which started in September, as far as the, the, the route of collecting data through the scan, through now. We're looking at, we've served so far 1,711 individuals and 685 families. These are um, unique visits. Um, and the, we figured that the average dollar spent through our programs on those families is, well, excuse me, individuals is $5.16. Um, the average spent on a family is $12.89. Um, and the average household comes about 2.81 times throughout the program. Over. So we're looking at all different types of data from different diagnoses. It helps us tailor the foods that we do get to the conditions of the people that are actually utilizing our services. We're looking at age. We're looking at all sorts of demographics. So for people who really like numbers, like I sort of do, I'm sorry, um, you'll be getting a report that sort of summarizes the last few reports. I've been sort of sending you a bunch of reports. So. Yeah. But uh, the Greenridge House Satisfaction Survey and information on the community nursing, but that is coming. Yeah. Good. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Report Tim. Yeah, one of the things that, that we've been talking about, especially related to the DEI audit, is making sure that um, our our services are distributed and reaching everybody who needs them. Will any of that, do you keep track of sort of the, I mean, the, the addresses within Greenbelt in t terms of knowing whether we're serving, uh, you know, a, a, a representative number of people from each part of the city? I know there's that one food distribution that's specifically for Greenbelt West, but do we track, for example, if the one in Greenbelt Center is getting people from east as well as center and west? We know that we are just because of case management issues and the people that we serve. So they're familiar faces. They come for diapers. They come for a variety of other services that we provide, but we are only tracking by zip code. Okay, so that yes, doesn't so that code. doesn't break it down very finely then by zip code. Yes. Um, okay. Do do those for those produce cards? Do they does that register them by specific address? Yes, they do put their address in there. Okay, so it might be something that would be possible to 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 analyze and make sure that we're 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 serving all areas of the community. You can get very granular. Okay, um, and just because I was asked, I saw a question about this the other day. If somebody still needs one of those cards, can they reach out to the CARES office and, and get one of the cards still? Yeah, program. Okay. yeah they can register at any time. And they okay. can walk get the up card. And register. Yeah. Okay, okay, so they can just walk up on the day of and register there. It's just then they get the card and. Yes. Okay, great. Well, I guess so there's a food distribution coming up uh, next week, right? Um, this week? Thursday. 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 Okay. Both here in the center and then at the same time over in uh, different in, times. Different times. Yeah. Same day though. Yes, same day. Mm -hmm. Very good. Hey, just out of curiosity, how how does the the food distributions and the the tracking and whatnot? How does that interface with the uh, uh, the WIC funding that's available? People have WIC cards 
and they can use those cards to buy produce and whatnot at the farmer's market when it's up and running. So how, how, how do we kind of coordinate all that? Well, for our program, since we don't have any qualifiers other than you know, you're a Greenbelt resident, you have a card, those are the only qualifiers that we have. So they don't have to use their WIC benefits. This sort of allows them to even add additional food, you know, stretch yeah. their food dollars even further because it's a, a free giveaway. And we're really, really pushing um, healthy options and looking at uh, providing additional resources as far as, for example, healthy recipes, things that are low in sodium, et cetera. So once we finally calibrate sort of the um, various diagnoses that we're serving, that'll, that'll give us even more data. But we try to stick on the low sodium, low, you know, that low sugar stuff, even though some of the kids are like, What's in there that's sweet? You know, that. <laughs> you need snacks? They always ask, you know, but. That's great. Hey, let's keep moving and uh, let's move on to the Youth uh, Family Service Bureau. At the same time, we can kind of move on to, uh, uh, because the, uh, the memo that, that you submitted sort of speaks directly to, to each of these sections. So uh, under, uh, what, what is a Youth and Family Service Bureau? There's sort of a definition uh, for these <coughs> entities and there's only, what, seven or eight of them across the state? Right. Um, so currently there are seven youth service bureaus that um, are recognized in the state. Uh, back when I first started 20 years ago, there were 21 youth service bureaus across the state. Um, so that's why we were down in Annapolis trying to regain funding so that we can get more youth service bureaus. But youth service bureaus are defined um, in Comar um, through the state. We're part of the Department of Juvenile Services. Um, and our goal originally was to prevent juvenile delinquency and to um, help um, youth um, succeed in school and in life. Um, and then here at Greenbelt, um, we've expanded that to offer services also to individual adults. Um, and then we added the senior program to help seniors thrive. Um, so here in Greenbelt, we um, have our Youth Service Bureau, which was started back in the 1970s, and since then have really grown, like I was saying, to add many, many services to help um, enhance um, the lives of Greenbelt residents. Very good, very good. So uh, if we go down to page 187, uh, you can see the uh, personnel and the uh, budget proposed for the uh, coming year. I, I did have one question on uh, line item number 53. Is that a mistake uh, going up to $12,000 on the uh, computer expenses? No, we are... Um, moving to a new system for data collection. like you know, So it's called Greenspace. Um, and Greenspace is a web-based um, program that's being used in many um, jurisdictions throughout the state um, that will allow our counselors a variety of measures they can use with people, whether it's anxiety, depression, um, to look at other um, issues going on with the people. So it's a way for us to um, offer those measures in a web-based matter and then be able to pull the data down to show what types of issues people are having. They can track them over time. So you can, over the course of therapy, every three months, have them fill it out again and see, is their anxiety going down? Is their depression going down? Um, so you can really track the progress that folks are making. Okay, is that going to be an annual cost or is part of that like set up or just kind of getting... getting? It's an annual cost, yep. Okay. Ms. Pope? Yeah, I have a question to um, the members, uh, membership and training. There seems to be a big, big difference. In terms of membership and training? Line item 45. Well, I think perhaps did some of that move to professional services because they seem kind of swip swapped. I have to look, pull up the. Professional services went up um, because we um, have a psychological consultant, and then we also now have a workforce and education consultant um, who is partially being paid through ARPA, um, but we want to continue her services with our education and tutoring and GED um, program. Um, so the training line item, um, I think part of that is several staff have gone on for um, certification in things like EMDI, EMDR, which is a specialized trauma um, therapy. Um, and then we had somebody else training in um, 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 PCIT, I think. And so they're able to um, apply, go get the training, and then the city reimburses them for it if it applies to their job. 
Um, and so I think that was the extra expense. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right, Bertha? That is right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Poppy. Um, I noticed you guys have the $10,000 for interpreting, which is great. Love to see it. Um, what kind of interpreting is that? Is that sign language inter interpreting, language interpreting? Is it all languages or uh, what is right, that? So now? right now it we were focused on sign language interpreting because we've had several um, families come for services where we needed the sign language interpretation. Um, we now have a bilingual um, staff member, another staff member who is, he just went on a trip to um, be immersed in Spanish so he can um, increase his Spanish and then we're hoping to hire a second bilingual counselor um, so that we're really able to serve um, in their first language. It's hard in interpretation um, to um, fully have therapy go smoothly. Um, with sign language, it's, it's different because they're doing it right along with the person, whereas in Spanish, they're listening and then interpreting. Yep. Okay. So in your memo, you, you talk in greater detail about some of the shifts, some of the adjustments that, that we're making in order to yep. uh, get back to normal, more or less, just in terms of the funding from ARPA. I don't know if you want to highlight any of those changes or go into greater detail. Right. I think we discussed them that the emergency case manager positions um, will be closing out um, as those programs that they oversee are closed out. Um, the senior mental health counselor position will be going part time. Um, the community health coordinator program, um, again, with that role um, ending in December, um, the funding for that, staff will be working to take over some of that um, services for the nursing program, but we'll have to cut back on that because staff won't be able to fully do what this part-time person was doing. Um, and then I list out the ARPA food assistance grants. We do have um, budgeted um, in the um, Gale budget to continue um, funding for the capital area food bank for the food distributions that ARPA was funding additional money to provide additional um, resources um, each month. Um, so we will, we do have that budget to continue, but the other um, programs that we're receiving ARPA funds for food assistance, like St. Hugh's Food Pantry, Master's Touch Food Pantry, which is part of Restoration Center Church, that's what their food pantry is called, College Park Food Pantry, um, Sardi's Catering, which provided the holiday food boxes. The last couple of years, we've been able to give out 200 Thanksgiving boxes and Christmas food boxes. Um, that was all ARPA funded. Um, and then um, Meals on Wheels, 33 additional um, residents in the community um, were provided um, meals each week um, with the ARPA funds. And, and again, th those funds will be um, no, no longer available. The one um, that we were able to put in the budget was... Um, for the capital area food bank, um, the 750 a month to um, maintain the level of service we're providing each month as part of the free food um, distribution. Yeah, we, we, we managed to, to pump uh, an incredible amount of funding into uh, food assistance and, and uh, rental assistance and business assist assistance through the ARPA funding over the past three years. Uh, uh, we're doing... Uh, doing what we can. Now, I urge you to, to try and uh, just build on that relationship, build the relationship with the Trinity Assembly of God Church, which is in Greenbelt on Good Luck Road, because they do have an active food pantry and food distribution uh, program over there in, in association with the Capital Area Food Bank. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah. yeah, just because there's a very related question online, uh, somebody who's new to the area and wants to find out more information, and uh, I'm going to direct her to the website, but also specifically wanted to ask, do you have to be a senior to get the food distribution? I believe the answer is no. Yeah. So that, and then there's a lot more information about CARES programs on the city website. Okay. And you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, CARES traditionally has been very, active in trying to seek out grant funding and advocating with the uh, county and with the state for additional funding. So uh, in, in as far as revenue sources, uh, if you want to put that up on the page, uh, back on the budget, page 187. Mayor, I think Ms. Pompey has a... Oh, uh, Jenny, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, as far as the uh, residents, uh, the 33 residents who were receiving the Meals on Wheels program who are no longer receiving it, is there anything we're doing to sort of try and help them find other services because three meals a day, five days a week, that's basically probably most of what they were eating. Um, Absolutely. So we have the funding through um, until it ends, which um, 
Right. Well, actually, the food assistance money, because this, the council had designated like $250,000, that will be ending around September, um, so the end of July. Um, and so Crystal is letting them know ahead of time mm -hmm. um, so that they have some time to plan, sure, making sure they know about the other food resources. And the cost is what per person? $5 a day. Yep. So it's $3,000 a month to feed 33 people five meals a day, five days a week. Or three, three meals, meals a day. Three meals a day, meals five, a day. Days, eight, yes. five days a week. That's, that seems like a very reasonable amount of money to me to feed that many people. Hey, uh, just in terms of the number of people that are doing helping with the uh, food distribution, especially the seniors, at one point uh, we were having a hard time getting enough volunteers to uh, to make all the rounds in Greenbelt East and, and also uh, uh, Franklin Park. So are we were we able to kind of resolve those challenges? We have been able to increase our volunteers, all different ages, men, women, children, especially now during the summer. Uh, children, students that need service hours, contact the Gale program because we have some work for you to do. Um, I think Gibbs just uh, recruited three more volunteers for drivers. So she just told me, yeah. And they help with the distribution as well and deliver to homebound seniors and uh, residents with disabilities as well through Gibbs. So they have routes that they do on a regular basis. Council Member McKinney. Does Meals on Wheels have any other service models besides the five days, three meals a day? So do they do like an abbreviated model? They have a three day mm -hmm. a week option. So it's either three days or five. And is it the same amount of cost? It would be $25 a week versus $15 a week. $5 a day, no matter which So it'd be $15 for three days or 25 for five days. Five days. Hey, uh, just to finish up on this page, uh, the bottom line under revenue sources is excess funded 100% by the city. So could you explain what that means? So um, that's how much the city puts in after they've calculated the grants um, and the other um, funding sources. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you want to pause? Shall we pause for some questions? Or let's go ahead and see if we can work through uh, page 188 and 189 uh, before we pause. Because I know Greenbelt Cinema is here and they, they look anxious. They want to. Are you reading the bottom pages or the pages on the. Um, sorry, just on the, the PDF. I'm yeah, sorry. so that's different than the, the written page number. I don't okay. know. It's just how PDFs work. <laughs> it's, it's the next uh, next page. So 192. Yeah, you got the performance surveys. Yep. Thank you. Any comments on those? No, I think you can see um, the performance um, continues um, to excel at Greenbelt Cares. We've really, um, in FY23, um, our formal counseling cases, um, we served 106 um, formal counseling cases, which means somebody who comes at least four times or more, um, if they come less than four times, are considered non-formal because um, maybe it was just for some um, reference or they weren't able to um, continue coming. So that's 106 um, individuals that we were able to um, serve um, um, in the formal counseling. Um, and under 18, so that would be 72 um, youth that we served um, in FY23. Um, and I just want to highlight down here under educational services, um, the GED program. Um, has really flourished um, after COVID when um, it took us a little while to get um, youth back on um, and attending the programs. Um, but you can see that in FY23, um, they were able to serve 72 youth um, in the GED program and helping them um, get ready for and then able to take the GED class. Um, there's four tests you take now. They divide it up. You don't have to take one long test. You take the social science. You take the science. You take the math. You take the language art. And it's nice because they can study just for that, take that section, pass it, and then they move on to the next one. So um, we've really been able to help a lot of youth um, who, especially during COVID, um, weren't able to finish school or got discouraged with school, um, get their GED, and then get back on track in terms of finding employment. Yeah, I was just going to say PG, PGCPS lost literally thousands of students, high school students, that just didn't come back. Disappeared and never came back. So yeah. it's great to see this program here in the city. It's great to see how successful it is. It's just so important 
So of course, it's like the kids who need it the most or the kids who sort of never return. So it's great to see that you're offering, we're offering this. Hey, hey one, thing, the one thing I wanted to ask about on this page uh, was a projection for this year in terms of the emergency uh, eviction services. And you're projecting that they will drop from 300 to uh, 100 this year. And are, are you actually seeing that year to date? For, for council, we, we get emails from people and, and often it's sort of like they're at the last, uh, last straw pretty much and they're just res reaching out. And I know some, we can't always help. Right, so currently um, the ARPA funds um, have been spent in terms of rental assistance. So when we do get a rental assistance request, um, we work with GILA, the Greenbelt Interfaith Leadership Association has a fund. And so we work with them um, to see if the person qualifies for their funds. Um, and then we also refer the person to the county. Um, the Department of Social Services has um, um, an emergency assistance fund where they can help folks. Um, and then um, the county um, kept going through their housing and community development, their ERAP. Um, so they reopened to ERAP, and so folks can um, once again apply for um, rental assistance through ERAP, which will pay up to 18 months. Um, so they have a much bigger opportunity by um, connecting with that program. So uh, we still receive, I would say, probably four to five emails, you know, request a week of people looking for assistance. And so we really are trying to connect them up with the county programs and then seeing who um, qualifies for the GILA fund. That's out of 25, some odd, 25,000 people. So it's, it's tough when someone, uh, you know, is in a desperate situation and they're looking for help and uh, <laughs> being able to respond in a timely fashion is also very, very difficult. But, uh, right, right. And then we're able to also make sure they know about the food resources um, and other um, community legal services if they need representation, um, if they're going to court and those kinds of things. And you mentioned the county ERAP uh, program. So sometimes if a person gets an eviction notice, once they get the notice, then they can qualify for the ERAP program? So ERAP does not, the county Department of Social Services program requires that you have to have received eviction notice um, which um, to apply for their program. The housing community development does not require that you have received um, an eviction notice, but they give priority to folks who have the eviction notice. So sometimes a person may get an eviction notice and, and they're, they're feeling rightfully so like, that, like they have no choice, they're desperate, but at the same time by getting that notice that actually opens up a couple of other possibilities. Right, and I will say landlords are also able to apply for the Housing and Community Development ERAP. So I know I spoke with Franklin Park and they were again doing a large application for 25 or 26 of their residents as a packet um, trying to continue to help residents um, who have been, gotten behind on their rent um, so that they can stay housed. So landlords are also still working on behalf of their residents who um, qualify to um, apply for that. Other uh, questions or comments? Let's go ahead and go to the next page, 189. Yes, Mayor Portem. Yeah, I had a question about this one because I noticed that we st on our community questionnaire scores, we still don't have the 2023 scores from November yet. Is that something we're going to be able to include in the final budget? It, just, it always seems like it takes so long to get those numbers, and it's they become much less useful if they get collected in November and we still don't have them by, you know, halfway through April. <laughs> Correct. Uh, this is a work that gets outsourced to the University of Maryland, so we have not received them. I know the assistant city manager, Jim Georgia, follow up though, a week or so ago okay. to see what the status of the reports are. Yeah, because I feel like that happened before that, that I remember that happening after 2021 as well. And I wonder if that is a system that is working the best for us, if it is taking that long to get useful information out of those community questionnaires. Right. Right. But we're working and our goal is to have those numbers back so they're part of this budget. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hey, let's go ahead and pivot to a couple of questions. Uh, there's a few questions online. Uh, let's see. And there's at least one in the room. There's a in question about uh, internships for clinical therapists <laughs> and college students this summer. Do we have any uh, openings? So, um, if somebody wants to be a, um, an intern um, in a clinical capacity, we do ask for a nine-month commitment. 
um, so at least two semesters, um, because it just takes that time to work up a caseload. You don't want to start with a family and individual and then have somebody leaving eight weeks later. Um, so if, if they're interested or if somebody has any questions, then they could just email us at cares at greenbeltmd.gov and we can let them know about the internship opportunities and what we have. What was that again? Cares at greenbeltmd.gov. Okay, so this individual should get a, get a hold of you through that email address. And there's another comment from the same individual. Uh, there's, uh, you know, it's a compliment. So uh, there's a young person, uh, this person has a, a child who loves the GED program and the instructor. So great job uh, for, uh, for helping with that. And there's another comment. Let's see, and this has to do with the evictions. If you have a writ from the uh, district court for ERAP, and uh, and there's uh, you know one of the grants from uh, Gila, so they want to know you know there's a with the Gila grant is there, there's a there's a cap on the amount. Uh, the Gila fund um, will give up to a thousand dollars. And person has to be able to kind of match that or how. So they need to show how they're going to pay the remainder of it. So if they owe two thousand dollars. Gila will um, offer up to $1,000, and then they have to show how they would pay the other $1,000, um, whether that's through getting money from Catholic Charities or Mission of Love or through the county program, just because um, we Gila could pay the $1,000 to the landlord, and then if the person can't pay the rest, they could still face eviction. And the, um, the point of the dollars is to make sure somebody stays housed. Um, and so we have to know that they'll be able to um, continue um, paying their rent. Um, so the Gila Fund is really set up for situational crises. So say your car broke down and the money had to go to that this month and not towards your rent. Or you got sick um, and you missed work. Um, so the Gila Fund is really set up for more situational um, type of crises that lead to somebody not being able to pay their rent. And that's why they don't require an eviction notice. You can be behind just one month um, and, and get assistance from the Gila Fund, whereas the county... DSS program to our social services requires an eviction fund, and the ERAP does not. But um, the Gala Fund obviously is an easier process. <laughs> so as we just said, uh, if, if you get a writ for eviction, that sort of opens up the possibility with ERAP to get uh, county or the county. Or the county um, Department of Social Services. It, it gets confusing because now the county has set up two different funds, um, but um, there's two opportunities there. Okay. But I think for some of these very specific persons, for the person online, it'd be better to reach out to the office directly. This isn't really quite the right venue for those very specific individual questions. But so I, I put, already put the, the CARES email address and the phone number in, uh, responded online. So yeah, that's more appropriate than the budget discussion. Okay, let's go ahead and let's go ahead. I think there's a question here. Any questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Orleans. Thank you. Going back to page 187, uh, in the top column, column uh, 510 Youth and Family Services, uh, Juvenile Delinquency Prevention Counselor, it says here authorized in 23 was uh, half time. Ms. Park, I seem to recall two or three years ago in response to a question that we, it was indicated that that half-time juvenile delinquency prevention counselor was going to be converted to full-time, maybe in conjunction with that person, that individual having additional duties half-time, but that, that full-time a position would be able to respond to juvenile delinquency needs as well as whatever else it was to be combined with. Do I remember that wrongly? Um, that has always been a part-time position. It's grant funded through um, a grant that we received from the Department of Family Services. Um, so I think um, the person who occupies it now could not do a full-time position for us. They, are, um, they work elsewhere. Um, and so part-time um, is what that position has been and has been funded through the grant. Um, I don't recall discussion of making it a full-time position. Um, I think... Um, 
Well, uh, apparently I remember it wrongly. Uh, going to another question uh, on page 192 at the very top of the page. We haven't quite gotten to page 192 yet. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, I'm so, yeah. I'm sorry. oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. Uh, satisfaction surveys. Uh, who conducts these satisf satisfaction surveys? Sure, we send um, out to um, people who have completed their therapy um, a survey that um, the county created as part of our grant. Um, and so we send them the survey asking them um, their satisfaction with the services that they received. There's not an indication of how many people were responding to the survey. Do we have that whole number? I can get that. I, I, you're right. It's not on here. We've never listed that. But in every case uh, in which there was a satisfaction survey uh, as, a, as a performance measure, each respondent indicated that they were satisfied or maybe more than satisfied. That's correct. One hundred percent of people are satisfied. Correct. Now, maybe those who aren't satisfied just don't respond to our survey. I don't know. But the people that do respond are very satisfied with the counseling services that it they've received. It would be useful to know uh, how many uh, responses, how many surveys were then, sent out, uh -huh. how many responses, respondents there were to the surveys. Uh, and I guess if the respondents, if those who responded were all in a, in a unanimous agreement that it was outstanding, uh, one hundred percent. Then, who's to argue with their mind? But I, I, the whole numbers might reveal something different, and I'd appreciate knowing the whole numbers. Sure. Thank you. Let's see. And also, uh, I, I believe uh, Miss Davis, Judith Davis, uh, has her hand up. Miss Davis, are you there? Yes, I am, and I'm hoping that I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Thank you. Jay Davis, and please don't say Judith, I hate that. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Right, Jay Davis, Greenbelt East. Um, going back to the memo, and, and by the way, uh, I just want to commend Dr. Park and all of her staff. I am not at all surprised that the survey, satisf the satisfaction survey has come back 100%. You all have been doing extremely well and professional help and and go way out of your way to make sure that everyone is taken care of and uh, has always been a feather in our cap for all of the work that you you and your staff have done uh, it's amazing how much work you have been able to do but back to your memo um, i know that and it's it's in the grant program we also do give money to the college park meals on wheels and i know in past years we have upped that amount uh, when needed. And that usually covers, I believe, you know, quite a few people in Greenbelt itself. So even though we used ARPA funds to give extra money, we also have this extra grant that we give to the College Park Meals on Wheels. Um, it was very enlightening to see that we basically gave for the food distribution funds $190,000 altogether, uh, and maybe more. Uh, so I can't even imagine how we could continue to do that just with our own funds without ARPA. However, um, St. Hugh's Food Pantry could probably use um, an extra extra handout if needed, but we could maybe ask. Maybe they don't need that. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I know in the past that council has kept a list of possible things that could be added to the budget. And to find out that to continue the full-time position of the community health coordinator would only require an extra $20,000 seems to me something that could be discussed during the final budget because it certainly appears that it was very worthwhile to have a full-time. And if it means that cutting that position to part-time means that, that half of the population that we serve now is not going to possibly be served and especially when in a further comment, you said that the request for health, uh, he health aid is increasing. I think that that is something hopefully that you will keep in mind as council to perhaps fully fund. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Hey, let's keep moving to, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Kiesel, please. Um, I just 
<clears throat> a very quick clerical error. Um, I think that on page 187 of the PDF in 530, um, you guys aren't getting full credit for dropping a full staff position instead of just half because it should be 1.5 for total FTE under 530. Okay, awesome. And then I wanted to echo um, Ms. Davis's comments about con possibly continuing that program or that position for the full year, um, because one of the concerns I had in reading your memo was that all of that workload of the remaining nurses would fall onto existing staff. And you guys already seem pretty heavily worked. Yeah. Yeah. So how how are you feeling about if your current staff could actually handle those caseloads? Right, and I'll let Crystal speak to it because it's really um, under her program. But you're right, we, we would have to ask staff to now start supervising the nurses um, and step away from other programs so we would have to choose services. And I think that other duties as a signed line item on everyone's job description, come unfortunately, but true in this instance would come into play. Um, I think with coming out of COVID, the onslaught of people that required services, um, through the nurses, we were able to truly make a dent in the number of people requesting services. But in the Gale program, we always try to accommodate the need. We hate telling people we, you know, there's a waiting list, especially for health services and in many instances um, to the most vulnerable people than, you know, in Greenbelt. So staff understands the importance of the program and is willing to step up, but we just have to modify and scale back who we'll be able to serve. And then people will go on a waiting list for services. Health services is the sort of thing you really don't want people waiting to access, but it is basically because of the funds available, what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And staff is willing to do it because they know how important the program is. Yep. I just had one more thing quickly. Um, I'm a community organizer at heart. So in reading your memo, I was like, it sounds like what people are really enjoying is the company. That's what I read over and over in the testimonials. So is there a volunteer program that perhaps when the Meals on Wheels is no longer going, that those volunteers could just go and sit in fellowship with someone. I, I don't know what, if there's a... Well, Meals on Wheels may not be going to our our locations. They're still going. They'll be still going and volunteering to other, other households or their routes will be reconfigured right. to accommodate other requests and things of that nature. Okay, so those aren't your specific volunteers? No, they're okay, Meals, on Wheels, yeah, okay. Meals on Wheels volunteers. Is there a volunteer program simply to connect seniors with <clears throat> companions? Yes, Gives. Okay. Gives volunteer services. Oh, what, beautiful. What, Great. One of the things I found that was also valuable is like you said that interaction with a younger adult um, but the, they felt many of the participants felt that they were helping it was giving them a sense of giving back also but at the same time they were receiving the services that they needed so they didn't feel like it was a handout mm -hmm. and for many of the clients that we serve that's very important that they feel that it's not a handout um, and helping the students in you know, in their role as receiving services was made them feel that it was a team, a sort of team effort. And, you know, maintaining the dignity of the people that reside in Greenbelt is imperative to the program being successful. And they, you know, they, they felt like they were getting visits from their granddaughter, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever the case may be. So do you want to talk a little bit about the state line where they'll call folks? And yes. Um, the state of Maryland also has like a telephone reassurance program. Also, the county has a telephone reassurance program. Um, those are available to residents free of charge. The one through the state is digital, digital. so I'm not really necessarily a fan of that particular one. But the uh, through RSVP, Retired Senior Volunteer Program, they do have a telephone reassurance program. But GIVES has that as well. Mm -hmm. But it's the face-to-face -face interaction for many of them, I think that's really makes it makes their day because a lot of them don't have people visiting period and they look forward to that as well mm -hmm. I, I would note that uh, a fair number of the meals on wheels volunteers actually are greenbelt residents you know i know six or seven of them and uh the others you know just a lot of local people from uh college park and from uh riverdale so it's uh they they do a good job and uh you know, we have a lot of people that want to volunteer and 
the green belt. It's a good thing. Uh, just to stay on track on page 193, we've sort of covered most of that information. Uh, do you want to, is there anything you'd like to note on this page? The accomplishments? Um, no, I just, I, I wanted to highlight um, the diversity training that um, our staff um, has been doing um, and the job fair that we're holding each year. Um, and we'll be holding that again in June this year. Um, we're eight, we partner with Beltway Plaza to offer that. And so Beltway Plaza has been a great partner with us um, to offer that each year. Um, and then really working with Greenbelt Middle School, Community School, and Spring Hill Lake Elementary Community School. So we're doing um, parenting classes with them, with um, the middle school, we're trying to get off the ground a Spanish literacy class. So it's for folks who may speak Spanish but don't read or write in their first native language. Um, so we're partnering with the University of Maryland to um, have graduate students and a professor from there um, available to teach folks um, how to read and write. Uh, because even if they get the flyers home from school in Spanish, if they don't read or write in Spanish, then they can't understand that. Um, so um, we've really been trying to rev up those partnerships with the schools and see what services we can offer in partnership. Because again, that's who folks trust. You want to go to who folks trust in the community and then start your service there so that then they get to know you. Yeah, I want to urge you to, uh, you know, it's you're already doing so much, but uh, Magnolia Elementary School has also been designated as a community school. And it's, yeah, it's in about three quarters of the students there are from Greenbelt. So, uh, and the, the principal there now was the uh, vice principal of the Greenbelt Elementary School. So it's a small world in yeah, the stag. Yeah. I didn't know that Magnolia was also a community school. Okay, great. That's what they said. Okay, any additional comments? Okay, well, let's go ahead and talk about the uh, Greenbelt Assistance in Living Program. Crystal Beatty, thank you for all you do with this program. It's just fantastic. Thank you. Language languages spoken English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Very yes. Good. I talk about uh, the personnel, uh, just the budget for the pro proposal for the coming year. Any changes? Big changes? Actually, where the salary lines it's expanding. Yes. Um, there's several things that have, are now in that particular line item. The first um, is going to be the ex removing. Our community, our bilingual, she's actually the person that speaks Arabic and French and Spanish and English. So, four lingual <laughs> <laughs> um, person to uh, the permanent position. So, that's reflected there. French We're, is very important, I think. In yes, she uses it quite frequently at uh, Franklin Park, actually, with her families there, um, as well as Arabic. So, she's been, she's used all of her talents here in Greenbelt. Um, but that position is reflected there as well as we moved to my line item, the assistant service coordinator from Greenridge House for budget tracking purposes for the HUD grant, the HUD service coordinator grant for Greenridge House is paid for, and I have to have clean numbers um, that are reflected in the report for HUD. Um, and that particular combining the line items of salaries, we had to be able to carve it out. So to my knowledge, mm -hmm. that's been um, reallocated into the salaries uh, line item as well. But that uh, position is paid for out of operating dollars from uh, Greenridge House. So we're no opera dollars. Um, it's just movement of the dollars to our account line item. So, so that position previously would have been in the budget, Green Rich House budget, and yes. moved it over. Was there any, did you just explain why you did that, or is there some reason? Yes, um, I'm required for HUD to submit varying reports periodically when I draw funds down, and we can't have another position in the report because they're going to say, well, how are you, why are you overspending the account? by the, the salary that was allocated in that one line item. Right. So, so to make it cleaner, cleaner for her reporting purposes, we're moving that position under this budget yes. rather than under 530. Just yes. so when Crystal pulls the reports, she's not having to Split. subtract all that other Split person's position out of it. Yep. Understood. Taxes, how much FICA, and I'm trying to back it out. We're trying to be more efficient. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Making my life easier. Okay. So that, um, and for those positions, um, any employee benefits that were associated with that are also, therefore, 
um, causing the increase in that line item. Most things remain the same. The uh, special projects line item is um, inclusive of the Capital Area Food Bank mm -hmm. um, monies that are there. And then what here is called community relations really is more like community events. So that's our, our back to school health fair that we do at Franklin Park um, or any of our other type Winter of Wonderland. Yeah, Winter Wonderland, our holiday events that we do. That's the line item for the, um, it should be 59 instead of 58. Let's Let's make that correction. Questions from council? There's 258. Oh, okay. Well, I think it's 58 in our system, but we can. Let's, uh, let's go to page 196, the uh, performance measures. One of the things I think that is sort of <clears throat> significant here, even though it still says 2021, 2021 was during COVID and many of our seniors did not participate in uh, the survey just because of not coming out to participate in the survey. So um, that number going down in, during COVID does not necessarily surprise me. I'm hoping that 2023, once we get those numbers, it'll be more reflective of what we were doing during the time frame. Well, looking at existing clients there, it looks like we've got one for every day in the year. <laughs> So how do we, how do you guys manage that large of a caseload? Well, we have different types of clients. We have, I would say, episodic clients. We have clients that participate in specific programs that we have. And then we have our regular case managed clients that are ongoing. Um, some of them come to us for time limited services, but others, we sort of provide ongoing adult service life management assistance that's a thing. so the ones that come uh, episodically or something happens mm -hmm. is, do, is there a way do you follow up after six months or a year just in terms of kind of keeping them uh caseload but, yes. but not active yes um, that's reflected in our online database um staff and interns also are then assigned to the families once they have been, um, the, you know, their situation has been resolved. We don't really close them out per se, unless relocation person obviously passes away or something of that nature. We try to keep them in the loop so that they know if they need additional support, even if it's just a check-in to see, you know, we just wanted to call, make sure everything was okay. And many, for many of our clients, that call is what then engages them into, you know, addressing some issue that may be, they didn't want to call and it's like, lots of times people say, oh, I'd rather, you know, someone else might need it more than me. Yes. And by making that call, that sort of opens the door for further conversation. And we've been using our community case managers and then the interns to continue those relationships. Because once we build a rapport with a client, that enables them to become more comfortable and then for us to help them with other services that they may not have initially called for. Right. So uh, this new uh, software package uh, is going to be something that is going to be used across all across uh, CARES. So how do you track all this stuff? Is well, it an Excel use, spreadsheet? or anything? We use different software packages. Ours oh, okay, is more of okay. a community-based care Community. management services okay. versus hers being a more clinical for therapy type of program. So ours is ask it's an ask database web based service that's more designed for um, care coordination versus a clinical case management. I mean clinical therapy. Okay. And this is all distinct from uh, from our financial management yes. and whatnot. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. To be HIPAA compliant and everything, it's all separate. Separate, yeah. Right. Although we do um, the police department CIT team uses our clinical database um, and also uses yours to stay in touch with us and track clients together. Sense, yeah. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, um, I was just noticing on that page um, the where it has the um, performance measures. Because I think some of those, so Gail Newsletter, that's number of copies distributed. Yes. I just wonder if maybe we can clarify that. 
Um, and I assume also then that the attend the community health events is attendance at community health events probably. Yeah, Not I don't yeah, there used to be little comments under the, what the two stars meant. Sorry, it, so it, you kind of listed out the community health events, the flu clinics, the produce distribution, um, the back to school fair. So counting all the people who attended yeah. all those. So that might be the because uh, yes, there's also the single asterisk under new clients and then the double for community health events that I'll talk to James. Figure I'm out sure. where that where the, what what those asterisks refer to and restore them from because I know I yeah there's a there's a lot of details in a two and almost three hundred page uh, document. Well, like coming to a whole new system, so yeah. some of it translated and some of it didn't, but we're going to work through it. Yeah. Hey, so at the uh, the bottom of that page, uh, which is 196 in the book or 192 in the PDF, there's some accomplishments listed. Do you want to talk or highlight about any of those? Yeah. I think the first one is extremely important. Um, our community case manager, Sharon Johnson, convenes our crisis interdisciplinary team, which incorporates the police department, code enforcement, uh, obviously the Gale program, a therapist from CARES, um, who focuses primarily on seniors and a representative from Greenbelt Homes Incorporated. And we work in conjunction with the police department's social work, social worker, who then in turn, um, in some instances, clients are referred by all various departments. So we may get a referral from GHI, we may get a referral to this team from the police department, or maybe it's code enforcement. Um, for conditions. We work in some instances with hoarding cases that come across various departments' um, radar. Um, the police go out for one thing and then they notice the conditions of the home. And then this team works to work with the family to avoid um, them losing their housing, for example, at, at GHI, if the um, matter can't be remedied or if that uh, they are at risk of being evicted due to the conditions of the unit. We tried to work with the family to seek out resources. But in some instances, it may be a health-related issue, or maybe it's something that our community nursing team can address. So we use the power of the team to link residents with um, the needed resources that the departments offer. And I think one of the things that's interesting is it's sort of like a one-stop shop not a Walmart of, you know, care, but you can come to, the, I mean, one meet person can come to this meeting's attention and get five experts in the various departments to assist. Yeah, so, and this is, this is one way, a cross-disciplinary team like this, this is one indirect way that the city staff is actually supporting our public safety or our, our uh, sworn officers who would otherwise be have to respond and spend additional time trying to, to triage these situations by, by having a team approach it. It really, it's just one small way that, that we are very directly supporting our uh, police officers. So I had a couple of questions about um, the accomplishments and uh, one had to do with uh, the funding uh, from the county and actually from the state, the Department of Aging, uh, I know that a lot of the, uh, the funding that we get for social services, for the youth service bureaus and for um, Gail actually comes down through the state Department of Health, right? She gets it from the Department of Aging. Yes, Department of the, Aging, Maryland exactly. Department, the Maryland so Department of Aging. That, that's what I was going to ask about. You know, we had a change. We have a new governor. It's not so new, but uh, it's a new administration. So ha have you seen any improvements or a shift? Uh, that, that department was, I hate to say it, but it was really, there weren't enough people. There was like 10 or 15 people working in that in the Department of Aging for the entire state. Yes. Um, we are funded at Green Ridge House by a grant, one of the grants that we have at Green Ridge House for our what we call our SAS program. Um, and it funds approximately $140,600 to provide supplemental support services to residents of Green Ridge House, um, including in-home aid services, um, meals, um, cleaning. cleaning services, just a you know, wide array of, of services. Um, it, in addition to the HUD service coordinator grant through HUD, fund most of the program and support that we offer at Green Ridge House. So um, under the new Secretary of Aging, we've seen quite a shift. 
Um, her expertise is long-term care services, the whole continuum. She's worked in a wide array of different positions over her years of tenure, and she's looking at creating a vision for healthy aging throughout the spectrum. So she's looking at from, you know, children all the way to seniors and pe ways that people can thrive in the continuum of lifespan. So it's a different approach from the previous secretary who was more business minded. Um, so it's, it's nice to have a colleague that has a geriatric background running the Department of Aging. So we're starting to see more innovative ideas and funding streams and bringing more grants to the community for people to apply for. So it's very refreshing. Yeah, that, that's really good to hear. So, and the way the funding, it's so, sometimes it would come from the federal government to the state and then the state to the county and, through the, the, and from the county to municipalities. So is more funding actually available for local jurisdictions and municipalities to, to qualify for? Well, the two funding streams that we have, both from the fed, federal government as well as the Maryland Department of Aging, were more geared around housing. Uh -huh. the, since we own Greenridge, the city owns Greenridge House, that's what made us eligible, um, more so than mainstream funding opportunities like 4501c3s and that sort of thing. So I haven't really seen many funding opportunities for um, municipalities through the Maryland Department of Aging at this point. Um, they have a tendency right now, from what I've been able to see, um, to work more with nonprofit industry to impact community. Just asking. And finally, <laughs> uh, you mentioned the uh, hoarding uh, with the multidisciplinary team. And I'm just curious, are, are you seeing an increase uh, of folks uh, of hoarding after COVID? I mean, it was such, such a difficult time and people were so insulated and afraid, older people, younger people too, were actually afraid to go outside. Afraid to go outside, afraid to bring things in, afraid to think, take things out. Um, I think as, as, as people began to emerge from their homes um, and re-engage with the world around them, it became very challenging um, as our team began to see. For example, when 911 responders respond to a person's home for a health-related emergency and they can't get in to provide the support services or they can't get a gurney in to provide the needed services. Um, just a wide array of collections that people have acquired during COVID became very challenging. And if a person's frail, it becomes even more challenging and sometimes overwhelming. Uh, so we have seen, I would say, a uptick, a large uptick um, that we are very slowly um, ticking away at. But I think there's many, many more cases um, that need attention, but they have to come before the committee. It's a, it's a big challenge. Well, GHI had a special program uh, for a while that was, they, they were working with individuals. Uh, was that connected to the city or was that something that was independent? That was quite some time ago. We had a grant um, that provided both a therapist and then a small stipend to address some portion of the behaviors. Yeah, that was pre-COVID. That's been quite a while ago. Now you remember that. Well, maybe that's something we need to look at again if there really seems to be an emerging <laughs> problem or issue with that. So, yeah. oh, yes, yes, because yes. <laughs> it is a large. There's often a mental health piece, and it's a very specific type of mental health service. And it's a it's a slow process. process. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a yeah, it's a long term process. Yes, it's a long term process. Yeah. Okay, well, let's keep moving. Uh, Daniel, has a... Daniel, please. One small thing under the performance measures where you have the community questionnaire scores, mm -hmm. is it possible to just maybe put an asterisk or a note on what this uh, scoring, was it the Likert scale, was it up to five? So this like is that? part of the community questionnaire that goes with the election. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's what um, Josue was talking about that the University of Maryland does. So it, it's the community questionnaire that... Well, she's wondering about the scale. On right, the scale do you know what the what? scale is? Way for the community, yes, correct. We yes. noted so if people mm -hmm. are reading it, they know that it's out of five, just yeah. so they know that's. I mean, because we want to, we just want to say that's a great score and what that's out of. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Since it's throughout it's the standard 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 department, department. Yeah. since it's throughout the book, I'll, we'll find a place to put a disclaimer, a disclosure. Thank you to clarify that. 
Thank you. Okay. Hey, let's keep uh, rolling here. Uh, and let's, if there are no additional questions on 196, because I want to be able to get to Greenbelt Cinema around 9 o'clock. So, uh, commu service coordinator program? Yes. The service coordinator program um, is the program that is funded by the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, through um, a grant that we have now had for almost 18 years. Um, it funds the full-time service coordinator at Green Ridge House, uh, the benefits and all that is associated with that a program as far as supplies and equipment and all of that. Um, and we, it, it, funding is always tied to, of course, the federal budget. So the 2024 fiscal year funding was just approved. Now we're waiting on, you know, and that could be months down the line as far as waiting to see when those dollars come. But we have been funded, like I said, ongoing for over 10 years for that particular program. Questions from council? Let's uh, pivot. Any questions online? I don't know. Nope, there are no more. On, oh, no. Jay has her hand up again. Hold uh, on. Jay, Jay Davis, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Jay Davis, Green, Green Belt East. I just had one question. Um, I know that we started a, a program and funded it to provide mental health services for the Green Ridge House residents. Uh, last year, you uh, handled 35 uh, folks, residents there, to give them services. Do you know how many we are servicing this in, within this past year? 35 was from the previous year. I know of 28 that have received services over the course of this fiscal year. That number may change before the end of um, June. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, and let's see, we've got a question here. Uh, Mr. Orleans. Thank you. Going back to page uh, 195, uh, I have a question about uh, special programs, line 58, and I'd be surprised if this question wasn't asked last year since the, the column I'm looking at is actually from 2023, but there was about an 80% jump from 80,000 to 140,000 in special programs. I'd be surprised if this question wasn't asked here, but I don't remember that it was, and I certainly don't remember the answer if it was. Uh, this fiscal year, it had been oh. reduced from 140,423 to so, 5,800. So what happened was the SAS grant that um, Crystal mentioned um, in FY23, the decision was made to list all the grants separately on a separate page. Um, and so the funds that were being shown in the Gale budget that were the um, Department of Aging SAS grant funds are now listed separately in the budget. And if I go back to last year's budget book, I'll find a breakdown of the SAS grants? It's, it's in the um, grant page, the... Um, We cover we cover all the grants received under the under the administration budget. We have a table of grants that have been applied and secured by fiscal year. So that would be present in this proposed budget. Well, I haven't read through the entire book for this year. I presume you're referring to the one this year. Will there be an, a little asterisk connoting that this has to do with what was formed? Oh, last year was it? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. So maybe we should put an asterisk there again this Indicating year. And again, I think. The translation of the asterisks maybe didn't happen this year in the new format. So I, I haven't read yep. through this year's budget book as yet. Yeah. Uh, but we I, could certainly put a comment in there reflecting that, that those monies have been moved to a different what, place. Was this question asked last year? I don't remember. I mean, there was a significant hike and then a, a obvious uh, reduction from last from two years ago to last year. I don't remember if the subject came up last year, did it? 
I, I don't know, but it it's because the money got it's the it's on page sixty three. It looks like is where the SAS in grant the is listed, among other places. Yes, yes in the right. book. So it's uh, not that the it's that it got moved. The money. It's not that the money necessarily the amount didn't change maybe that much. It was it just, just how the budget was organized. It was decided to put because it's funding from a grant that goes to services to put it in a different place. Let me jump to page 196 with a quick note that I think the reclassification uh, to of the Gale program to uh, assistant director was well-deserved, likely. Uh, I don't under, fully understand the salaries component, but my question has to do with accomplishments. Uh, the second bullet is community health caseworker is available to meet with residents in the Spring Hill Lake Clubhouse twice a week, et cetera. Uh, do we know how many uh, instances where the a one of the two community health caseworkers met with residents in, in the clubhouse at Spring Hill Lake, Rec? And secondly, uh, the third bullet deals with the bilingual community outreach coordinator hosting quarterly coffee and conversations for Greenbelt West to talk about, et cetera. Do we know how many of those coffee and conversations uh, in which the number of Greenbelt West residents participated? We have had three of the quarterly coffee and conversations. The coffee and conversations have, <laughs> this is sort of interesting, the coffee and conversations have not been as well attended as I would have liked to have seen them be. And one of the things that the feedback that we get is like, I can make coffee at home. <laughs> so I think that they're looking for more than coffee <laughs> for the event for them to come out. They, I mean, we've heard that quite a few Even times. So <laughs> I don't know if it's going to, that would be a lot of conversation. But um, so we're a little bit challenged in our food budget, so we're not going to be feed, feeding, serving breakfast to make people come out. So that's still a work in progress, trying to get more people in, in attendance um, for the coffee and conversation. But the concept behind the coffee and conversation was to be able to engage and get more um, Greenbelt West resident participation and feedback on designs of programs and services that and we Madam bring. Assistant Director, I have no problem with the concept. I think it's a fine concept. I'm just wondering if we know how many participants either in the uh, meeting with the <clears throat> caseworker in the Spring Hill Lake Clubhouse twice a week, how many residents actually did that and how many actually participated, even if it's a small number, in the coffee and kind of oh, conversations. Uh, okay, thank you. I was, that was a question. We're, we're at five minutes here. I would I would say that I can give you a guesstimate on that number. I can't it's not going to be exact, but I can say that for the community case manager meeting with people in Franklin Park, on average she sees about 45 different clients over the course of a week in meeting with the clients there. Uh, I'd look forward to some Okay, thank you. Some uh, excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Excuse I, me, you're past five minutes, My sir. hand was raised for 10 minutes before well, you were past five minutes, minutes now. I'm dealing with so three separate you subjects. Lower your voice and step I'm away from the microphone, I'm dealing with three separate subjects. Please. Finally, uh, well, with regard to that. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you know, I just asked you, would you mind having, we have other people who are waiting to speak. If there's anyone present. in here who wants to raise his or her hand, I'd be happy to sit down. In the well, meantime, do I'd so like now. to emphasize that I had several questions. Sir. Waited 10 minutes. Go on, just. I have a last question uh, with regard to the grant uh, revised, the grant program uh, having to, assisting residents of Green Ridge House for a variety of reasons. Uh, my understanding is that the rule of Green Ridge House is that if a resident there requires too much assistance, they're asked to leave. And I know, in fact, over the course of the last several years, several residents have indeed been asked to leave Greenridge House. One of the reasons given was that they required too much assistance. I think that's wrong, but I'm happy to hear that we're providing assistance for residents of, Green, of Greenridge House. My question is, how much assistance are they able to receive? How much are we able to provide before they're asked to leave Greenridge House? Thank you. The SAS program provides four hours a week of services, and that's what's funded by the grant. Um, and that includes light housekeeping, bathing assistance if they do need that, um, trash removal, that sort of thing. So it's very light in that respect. But to my knowledge, if a person becomes too infirmed to reside independently, 
we coordinate with family and friends to get them the proper level of care. If that cannot be delivered within the unit and the person becomes a risk to self or others, we do work with that family. But it's not a matter of evicting them. It's finding the right level of care that's appropriate for them at this stage in their life. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, please. Good evening. Claudia Jones, Laurel Hill Road, and hopefully I won't open mouth and insert foot, but your Gale Community Health Coordinator write-up, okay, on page one, the second paragraph, mm -hmm. as of 2022, the census data reported 24,646 residents. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression at that time we had 23,000-something residents, okay? I know now we have 24,921 residents living in Greenbelt because of the uh, condensed uh, budget book that I reviewed that was nicely put together. Thank you, Mr. Salomon and your staff. You did a wonderful job. And that you can find that on page 12. So, and I, the reason why I know that because I was looking over the police budget. So I had a question which tied into the number of residents. So I'm not even sure how many residents we had in 2022. The, the numbers don't, they don't add up. They differ. Okay, so I'm not too sure. But anyhow, I want to read this. As of 2022, the census data reported 26,646 residents, where 8,133 were over the age 55 plus, which puts me in that age bracket as well. Okay, uh, so as I'm understanding this, as of 2022, there were 8,133 residents over the age 50, okay? Out of that 8,133 residents, and I know I'm not included, so we'll put 8,132 residents. How many residents did you provide service, services to out of the 8,132 residents? Over, let me just look at my numbers here. We have residents that were attended a variety of different services. So, for example, they may have come to our health events or whatever. And then we also have residents that are ongoing case management. So we have, depending on if you want a total of everybody that's been served. Yeah. So incidentals, we're probably looking at about 2,500 to 3,000. Okay. Out of that's whether it's the nursing program, whether it's the produce program, whether it's residents at Green Ridge House, the SAS program. So we have different points of entry mm -hmm. to the Gale program. So it can be, you know, calling for information and referral, or it can be ongoing support services, such as case management services, or it can be episodic services, like they come to produce or a health fair event. So there's different ways that we serve. People. Does that tie into the crisis intervention too? Would it be counted in the crisis yes. intervention? Yes, because they're in our database. Okay, and you work with the Greenbelt Police Department of the crisis intervention? Yes. And you're still doing that? Yes. We meet okay. on a monthly basis. Okay. And then and if we get referrals from them, you know, intermittently in that yeah. respect. Um, I like the fact that you tie this into GHI as well. I did not know that, so it's a very good thing because you have... Unfortunately, we do have a hoarding situation, but our units are so small, too. And, yes, I could see an uptick in COVID. I can see that, but, you know, you're, you're working on it, and I commend you. I applaud you for it. Thank you. One other thing, and then I will go sit back down. On page uh, Greenbelt Assistance and Living Room Living Program Cares on the page 195, there's an uptick on 58 that Bill just mentioned in special programs and went up $6,200. Mm -hmm. You know, from 13,800 to 2,000. What are those special programs? Okay. Right. So they're listed under there. So um, the other special programs is the volunteer lunch, um, and what was the other one that's under I'm there? Trying to find which page that is. But I'm the sorry. additional um, funding is to continue the um, capital area food bank at our monthly food distribution. That's what that uptick is to cover that um, continued food resource in the community. You're doing a wonderful job. I thank you. How much of the uh, uptick is specifically for capital area? All of it. All of it. 
<laughs> Thank you. Hey, I, I just want to really, you know, on behalf of council and all of our residents in the city of Greenbelt, really thank you, Dr. Park and Crystal Beatty and your whole uh, department on the uh, important work that you're doing, just uh, providing a lifeline to uh, the seniors, working with young people, working with people in difficult situations, uh, evictions, so many things. And, uh, you know, we're, we're fortunate uh, that we actually have Greenbelt Cares, a social services department, because most of our, our sister municipalities in Prince George's County and really across the state do not have their own social service departments to, to augment, augment what the county does. So a great deal of appreciation for the forward-looking programs that, and the things that you've proposed in, in, in the budget. So we'll think carefully about what uh, the city manager has, has put forward and, and uh, work into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you Crystal. And I truly, you know, appreciate your all support and that we work for a city that wants to have a social service department and support people on this level. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, it's hard work, but must be done. Uh, I have a, a response to the question about where the HUD service coordinator grants is reflected, and those grants are reflected on page 111. 11? Yes. <coughs> I mean, thank you. So we, we covered a good amount of ground tonight. We are, you know, in the uh, packet that was posted online, we had said that we'd be talking about grants and contributions and other funds, and that's actually going to come on May the 6th and later on in our budget discussions. So we are very, very pleased to have the executive director and staff of the Greenbelt Cinema with us tonight. Uh, the spotlight board the spotlight is on you the the, the gray carpet is rolled out <laughs> and uh, we do you have the envelope mr someone <laughs> all right until it's in, it's going to be coming in eight to nine months if we're talking about the two hundred and fifty thousand. sorry the three hundred and fifty thousand. Oh, don't don't oh, mention oh, the don't bond mention the, the issue that's a request that's been approved because we haven't gotten the letter yet, even though we've gotten the word. <laughs> so we're not talking about that. Okay. Hey, welcome. It is so great to be able to sit and talk with you uh, tonight. Uh, see you all the time around Roosevelt Center. Don't always have a chance to, to delve deeply into the issues, the day-to-day -day operations there. But uh, we're so fortunate to have uh, an operating dynamic uh, cinema in the city of Greenbelt and the unique, and I guess it's not that unique, but it is kind of unique for a municipality to own a movie theater and to, to have a nonprofit organization actually running <clears throat> running that uh, facility. I, I think it makes a huge difference just in terms of uh, the impact that it has here on our residents, the community, in terms of all the outreach that you do, and uh, just in terms of the the programming, I, I, you know, I, I tell people, and they, they usually give me a hard time. I, I say, well, we show we show films in Greenbelt. We don't just show movies. We're, we're showing films. <laughs> right, important distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we don't always adhere to, but yeah. Right. So, uh, Dr. McGrath, uh, welcome. And so you, you submitted a uh, some information for us, and yes, that's, uh, we should put it up on. I feel like we should, you know, we've had the previews, and what do you call it? Dim the lights. Yeah, yeah. dim the lights. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I apologize for I didn't realize they were going to get printed out. So sorry for the color cartridges that we probably burned through on this. But um, yes, so I uh, put together to start with. I thought because we are rounding into our tenth year of operations. Um, I know, time flies when you're having fun at the movie theater, but um, I thought it might be useful for all of council, but in particular for those members who weren't part of the sele selection process in 2015 to just get a quick recap of who we are, what we do, where we've been. So that's those first few slides. Um, so, yeah. So, the um, you know, we we began our partnership with the city in, honestly, it began in 2012 when we first were asked about the renovation process. Uh, but before we even were selected as an entity, we were focused on what the space could do for the community. Um, I had moved to Greenbelt in 2011 and was thrilled to discover the historic cinema here. My husband and I are both film scholars, so we, even though our children were small, we lived on Ridge and uh, 33 Court, and we would just roll down the hill. We would take turns who got to see a movie. And, uh, and so 
it really felt like there was a lot of potential in the space. And when the uh, theater closed for the renovations that the city was planning, we coordinated with the recreation department to offer the Moonlit movies. And they were wildly successful. We had, as this article says, 200 when I dressed up like Miss Piggy. Um, but sometimes we had as many as 400. We had one that had 500. So it just really demonstrated that there was a lot of interest and uh, demand and desire from the community to have a space that was not just showing movies or films any old time, but was actually looking to engage with the community. Um, so the next slide. Uh, so we... <laughs> We became quickly involved in, you know, marching in the parade, being at the farmer's market. We started out literally with a jar um, just at the farmer's markets trying to gather funds to support what we were doing. We sold the gray T-shirts. We encouraged people to come to city council meetings to, you know, support our idea for what a nonprofit or organization could do as opposed to the for-profit entity that was running it at the time. Uh, the next slide. Well, oh, uh, yes. You know, yep, the sorry. ruby slippers. I yeah, do you, you like those? You clicked yeah. your heels together three times <laughs> and you were it, here in Greenbelt. Right. That, you were home. It was more than 10 years ago and I have had to retire those. But yeah, I need to pass on the Dorothy outfit to somebody else at this point. Um, so on our opening night, we were thrilled to do throwback prices to 1938. And we, at that point, we had... Uh, we showed Little Miss Broadway, which is the very first film to ever be shown at the cinema. And um, we signed up 300 people to be members. So at this point, we'd been going for um, almost two years as a nonprofit. And there was just so much excitement and enthusiasm about this um, potential for what we were going to be doing. So it was it was a really wonderful start. Um, so the next slide... Oh, yeah, so that's that night. Oh, so we had yeah, the whole red carpet event, and we did a, a throwback series because the theater had been closed for almost a year. So we did this What We Miss series, and Still Alice and Boyhood um, were the first two films. And Boyhood was the very first one, and I, I will never forget seeing that um, title screen come up. I'm standing at the back and just, like, tears streaming. I was so excited to see it, like, actually, you know, come to life and have the the, the theater full of people. Well, that's really what we're about Um and I'll get to that with the pandemic, but that was so hard that we couldn't do that. It was really hard. To, it was one of the spaces you could not be in during the pandemic. So, okay, next slide. Uh, and here is the transformation. So when in 2019, you know, the, um, the uh, renovations that the city planned for stopped at the inner lobby. And so it was one of the things we said in our bid is that we as a nonprofit would be able to partner with the city to raise funds, that we understood there were certain things that, um, you know, as a nonprofit, we could reach out to the community and that they would they would literally buy in and be able to donate to a nonprofit organization and, and be in support of what we were doing and continuing it. So as you can see, the the chairs went from that drab brown to the the, the beautiful ones that we have now. It's it's an amazing transformation. Yeah. But, but I do want in the before picture. I yes. see uh, in the upper left hand corner is uh, the 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 special uh, accommodation equipment Rear that window. we put in mm -hmm. there for yep. for the uh, for the visually impaired. There, that's something that we did before the before the renovation. for the hearing. It's for the, for the hearing, hearing impaired. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Because it, it it yes exactly. So it it allows um, a patron to borrow one of the devices that captures that those words you can't read them but they're in reverse and so it captures them sort of like a little mirror that you can angle to create captions so it's so cool you put the little yeah. mirror in, in your in cup, cup holder, holder and you can you can see the caption yes and we worked with the um with the deaf and the blind and the hard of hearing community in greenbelt beforehand to determine which was the best system because what a lot of places do is they have these glasses. And if you wear glasses, to put glasses on glasses, and then you can't move your head because otherwise the words are swimming. So this was by far the most popular, and they have now discontinued it. So we are one of the few places that can still do it. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, and while those renovations were taking place, we operated the pop-up. We were able to move into the storefront next door and have a little micro cinema of 40 seats. You can see it was just sort of drapery and, and church chairs on a flat surface with some tiles that we got from Community Forklift. But, um, it you know, it served its purpose. Uh, and then because it was so popular and we, we saw the potential there, if you scroll down to the next slide, uh, we were then able to, in... 2019, 2020, uh, save up, get grants, and renovate the space into the permanent state-of-the-art micro cinema that you see there with the green seats, and then our um, media arts lab um, in the in the other half of the space. 
was just so amazing seeing the the transition from the maker space and all the stuff in there. And yes. just as a note, it's it's George Boyce's uh, birthday today. Oh, but, happy birthday, George! But uh, you know, it it uh, is transformational. And just I remember coming by and seeing you in there with your overalls yes. there and a paintbrush yes. and goggles and everything. Right. And drill. Yeah, yeah. Our architect um, just sent me a photo of that, and and um, I had to don those overalls just the other day to do another project. So, uh, yes, it was very exciting to, to be able to transform it into a temporary space into something more permanent so that we are now, because running a single screen historic theater is extremely difficult and having the second screen makes a huge difference and it completely, um, transformed our ability to do our educational programming as well. So that's been, that's been a real bright spot. Uh, if you scroll down, you can actually see next one things happening in that space. So we have our adult education uh, lectures that are happening over there on the left. We have uh, now some guest lectures that are coming in. We've rented out the space for parties, for other private events. And then the bottom right there, perhaps my favorite, is the kids in camp. So we um, are now, it's an annual tradition that we partner with the Greenbelt Camps to provide um, media literacy education to go alongside what they're doing. And you can see they are very much into it. So, yeah. Um, next slide. Uh, so, but as I said, during the pandemic, we had to do a lot of things to get very creative. And so we did more moonlit movies. We did more outdoor movies. We did online um, streaming conversations where we were able to give people access to movies. And then we would have a little Zoom conversation just to try and keep that sense of community going. And then the most popular thing was our um, our popcorn pickup, our movie night takeout service. So people could place their orders and they couldn't watch a movie with us, but they could get their favorite snacks. And so again, it was a way where it, some people, it just made all the difference. We had this sort of elaborate system of putting it on a cart and somebody would come for their order and then push it through the door and, you know, to keep our distance. And, um, and it was just, it was all that we could do. You know, we were all furloughed on an unemployment. We were, you know, volunteering our time. It just really mattered to us that we keep that consistency because we, up until the moment of the pandemic, we had just never shut our doors. I mean, movie theaters have to be open 365 because those are the, the holidays or the days that people want to come see movies. So just to have never shut our doors and then have to shut for over a year was quite um, a shock and quite a challenge to us. But um, if you scroll down the next slide, you can see that uh, obviously we were not alone. Uh, movie theaters were the literal poster child for the pandemic. And um, there was a, a kind of a misconception that, that developed early on that movie theaters are one of those most dangerous places to be. Whereas actually, um, and I don't fault anybody who didn't want to come, I completely understand, but restaurants where you're facing people and chewing, like there's a lot of air moving there. But uh, anyway, so we, we had a real steep climb there. I think it's, you know, one thing you have to eat to survive. You don't have to go to a movie theater to survive. So people would stay home and... That's Beetle. Yeah, <laughs> some of us more than others. Yeah, um, but so people developed other habits. Um, there's there's a new uh, there was a new study out or, or um, survey results that the average household now spends sixty one dollars a month on streaming services, which obviously is way up from where we were pre pandemic. And what that means is, if people are investing in those streaming services, then they have even more, you know commitment to yeah to staying on their couch uh so we are that is a that is a, a challenge for us as a theater uh, well I, I know with uh, a lot of uh I, you know i love music i love jazz and a lot of the uh the, the jazz clubs you know are now when there's a live performance even at the kennedy center they're they're offering uh, an alternative where they can there's a streaming there's a ticket for uh to be there in person but there's a uh the the option of getting a uh, ticket to to, to stream mm -hmm. the the concert or whatever. Yeah. So is it possible? The movie theaters. Uh, well, we that? um there were some distributors very early on in the pandemic that did allow that that put their content behind a paywall that we would then have a special code that you'd buy a ticket from us and then you'd get the code. Um, it's no longer an option. Or I mean, if it is, it's separate from us. I mean, obviously there are some movie and there's some some sort of high-end services that offer that that you can stream directly from them uh but as far as the movies you know if if it's showing theatrically you have to go to a movie theater we can't offer that so you're, you're we're at the mercy of uh the distributors always always <laughs> yes everything is on the studio's say so 
Yeah, it's one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what this means is that people develop new patterns. We have seen a number of patrons. Um, you know, the the people who are most COVID cautious are uh, over 65 females. And that is the bread and butter of an art house theater audience. We are doing everything we can to bring in younger folks, and we are seeing that increase. Um, but nationwide, it's in all the surveys, it's just that's the way it is. Um, those are art house theater patrons. The, the most common patron of a multiplex is a young male, and he is very much not COVID cautious. So for, for, blockbuster movies, you know, Top Gun, all that, you'd see those numbers of like, oh, the movies are back. Well, they are if you can show, you know, Fast and Furious 25 or whatever it is. Yeah. So. Uh, what, what is the state of the, what, I, I don't want to go off topic too far, but what, what is the state of the industry? I know, uh, you know, we've got an AMC uh, theater in Greenbelt, but there are other locations. I think the, the theaters in Bowie near the Bowie Town Center are closed. That one closed, right. So if you scroll to the next slide, it's as though you knew I was going to say this. Um, yeah, overall, you know, 2,000 screens have been lost. So in large part, this is to do with everything that I've just said. And it's exacerbated in the for-profit model because if people don't come and buy tickets, that's it. There is no other source. Um, or, you know, concessions, and those go hand in hand. Um, but for a nonprofit theater, we do have the ability to apply for grants, to have donations, you know, that sort of thing, memberships even. Um, and that has helped us. Uh, I think if we did not, if we were, if the if the cinema were being operated as a for-profit, it would have closed, and I don't know that it would have reopened. Because we're a nonprofit, we've been able to keep going, but it's still extremely challenging. Um, as you'll see in our financials, we have, you know, yet to have a, a quarter where we are not operating at a loss. So we are still existing and um, uh, subsisting on our COVID relief funds. We are seeing that improve. Like I say, we're seeing things tick up in the right direction. We are seeing younger people come in. We're trying different things to get people to come out, but it's still not back. The industry has been quite um, soft. And Partly that's the pandemic and partly it's the unfortunate, uh, you know, um, collision with the writer's strike. So a couple of things happened there. When the strike was going on, obviously no new content was being generated, which for movie theaters, it was a big problem for writers. It was not such a problem for movie theaters uh, because that pipeline is further down. That's sort of something we're dealing with now. Uh, but there were studios that had films in the can ready to go, but they refused to release them because it wasn't just the writers, but it was the actors. When they joined in, now actors aren't going to go out and promote them. They're not going to go on the late night shows. They're not going to go to the award ceremonies. So they didn't want to run the risk that their movie wouldn't perform well because their talent wasn't out there doing the circuit. So that meant that we had a number of films. Dune 2 is a perfect example um, of a film that got pushed because they just said, well, if Zendaya is not going to be walking the red carpet, then we're just not going to release the film. So is there like a bubble of, uh, of movies that are about to be released that were uh, sort of held up because of the writers and the actors' uh, strike? Somewhat, uh, but it's basically there was a there's a a trough, an anticipated trough of content that wasn't going to come out at that point because nobody was writing on it, and so now they can drop those films in. So it's not a bubble; it's more just like status quo, if that makes sense. So it doesn't really help us, um, unfortunately. So. Uh, but the, the next slide, if we could, um, there are many things that we have tried to do and we have, we went through a major rebrand, as you can see in the top right, we went from old Greenbelt theater to Greenbelt cinema. Uh, we invested in, uh, more social media, um, attention, you know, putting more of our time and attention into those channels, especially Instagram. And we've seen dividends with that. We've also hired an, uh, out side marketing consultant who is working with us on that and doing we're right now doing an ABC testing um, model of like different ads and seeing how they perform and and learning from that where you know how to um, further refine our social media posts and ads and we've added beer and wine so um, all of those together I think have helped to contribute to the the slight uptick that we're seeing but it's just not happening fast enough so we still are not back at pre-pandemic levels. We still don't, we're, we don't have memberships back at that, that pre-pandemic level. So everything has been um, 
uh, all the numbers are, are sort of still weighed down by the the, the long tail of the pandemic. Uh, the next slide. So this is, I apologize that the um, the type is so small on there on the right, but I can um, just briefly walk you through it. So the, the, the bounciest, noisiest line there, the red is, um, yes. <laughs> and um, the reason why it's so bouncy is because you can see that the, sorry, just so I can make sure I've got my numbers right. The, the, the first year that we're tracking it there is, um, well, we, this is over six years. So in 2018, we started to raise funds for the renovation. So in 2019, you can see that's that big spike. And then 2020 hits and it completely bottoms out. And then when more relief funds are coming in, then that big rise again in 2021 is all the federal, state, and local grants that we were getting, as well as some of the funding that we were getting to renovate the pop-up space into the screening room and media lab. And now it's tapering back off again because... There just isn't um, that level of grant funding for COVID relief. So we're back to the, the usual programming grants and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, the bottom lines there are for um, rental merchandise and advertising, and those have been holding fairly steady with a slight increase. Uh, you can see that um, memberships is, is climbing back up, but it's still not at the 2018 level. And the same goes for um, concessions and tickets. Those two track together, although you can see that tickets have dropped way off. And Again, they are climbing back up, but they're nowhere near where they are at the, you know, that, that pre-pandemic number. And for us, 2019, they went down. That probably would have been more of a straight line, but the main auditorium was closed. So that 2019 number is just what we could do in the 40 seats, yeah, which is a big difference from 368. Um, and then uh, you can see that, you know, membership, oh, sorry, I said that, um, total donations is another one that is starting to to climb back up. So we are overall, if you if you scroll to the next page, is just a, an overall snapshot. We are moving in the right direction, but what you can see, it's just very stark there that our total expenses are... Um, not are, are are outpacing our net income. And one of the main reasons why you have that huge divergence is that at a certain point we had to make the decision coming out of the pandemic to go from three, four days a week where we were starting to just dip our toe in to see if we could get people to come back. We had to make the leap to seven days. We couldn't get the movies anymore to your point about streaming. In the beginning, the the distributors, they were just grateful for any theater that decided to open. And so they would say, fine, if you're going to show it three days a week, four days a week, it doesn't matter. Yes, we'll give you any movie you want. And then as more theaters around the country went seven days a week, they looked at those of us that were not yet full, fully back open. And they said, well, no, you can't have that movie. You either show it seven days or you don't get it. So then it was this question of like, okay, so now we can't get the content that we want anymore that people want to see. So we have to make that leap. So we had to, to go full-time staff and, you know, lights on, everything all the time. And if I could also, Caitlin talked about the way that people's habits changed and getting people, We want, part of the decision was if we're not open seven days, then do people like think about going to yeah. the movies on any day? Or if they say like it was too much for people to plan, we thought if we're, if we're here seven days, if they're like, that's Tuesday, I would like to see a movie and we're closed, then that would discourage them from coming back for a couple months. But it was really a leap of faith and it was a matter of faith in the idea of a cinema still being a vital part of the Greenbelt community and the support of the Greenbelt community. So it was really like this jumping off into space that was quite terrifying. Yes. And <laughs> what this shows is that like people are coming, but you know, we're, there's, there's a bit of a free fall still feeling of, and, but it was, it was an act of faith in the larger community support. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and I mean, even just at the logistical level of Washington Post wouldn't post our showtimes if we weren't open seven days a week. So it was suddenly like all these people that relied on that. So there were just all of these ways in which people, you know, if they came by, like we say, maybe people don't pay attention exactly to what day of the week it is. So they would see the closed sign and think, oh, they're still closed. And we would have people say, oh, are you back open? We're like, oh, my God, yes, we've been open for six months. But because they weren't seeing us every day being open, they just would make the assumption when they go to the co-op, like, oh. It's Thursday. They're closed. So we, we um, like Kathy says, we just had to, to make that leap. And it has been, um, it's been challenging because we, it's not as though, I think what happened was the audience that was coming on the weekend, we've just sort of spread them out over the seven days a week.
Well, yeah, you mentioned the Washington Post, and you know, I, I get the digital version, and I look at it uh, every day, and I, I peruse it pretty thoroughly. And I, I don't, are there are there movie uh, listings in the Washington Post? I, I don't see them in, in the we, digital. We are still fighting that. We are still fighting to this day. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, and there's no logic to it. So we're we're, I have an active email chain with the guy who's supposed to be. The problem is, um, yeah. I, I they are. See them. They are. And I mean, it used to be that it was very easy to find us because it was just the one screen. So the two bars were very close together and you could hone in on that. And that was us as opposed to 14 screens. Um, but for some reason, the Post outsources their movie listings. They don't do it themselves. So I can't call somebody at the Post and say, hey, we're not there. And they say, oh, sorry, and put us in there. It's this third party. And the third party says, well, we're sending it to them. And, and the Post is saying, well, when we get them, we put them in. So it's a little bit of a... So, so where where do the uh, patrons come from? Do they come based on word of? The, is it based on people actually seeing the the, the movie things on on the uh, the. On the, on the board outside. On the marquee? Or is right. it a word of mouth? Is well, it, it's, is it uh, the food specials that they have, the New Deal Cafe? Right. Social it's, media. It's social media. And it's, you know, it's the news review. It's our website. So we just switched to a new system where we have a better website. So website thank you. Great. It's it's working a lot better. Um, and it is social media. So that's where we're seeing younger people come in. So it's wonderful when we see new young faces. And it's clear that they have found us from Instagram, that sort of thing. On a... Um, being that you're a nonprofit, can you post on things like Fandango or not? Um, Fandango had a, they used to allow theaters to, um, uh, independent theaters to, to be listed. And then they shut that down after the pandemic and they just had a one-to-one -one with one of the, um, I think it was with Regal with one of the major chains. Uh, and now the new service that we have, this it's a, it's our website, our point of sale system, our everything. They're working on, you know, getting us back into that. So that's a hope that, yeah. I guess with me, you know, I, I'll hear about a film. Maybe I'll see a review or hear about it. Then I'll look around. When I want to see it, I'll look around to see where it's playing. Right. And I'll go to the... Uh, well, first I'd go to the Greenbelt Cinema, but after that I'd go to the the nearest or uh, the theater with the uh, amenities that I might be looking right. that I might be meeting somebody else. So it would be someplace that's close to in between where we both are. Right. So I guess there are a lot of things that, that are factors. If you go to the last slide, I'm wondering, you know, I'm seeing the ups and downs, and it almost looks like uh, like the COVID uh, numbers. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, looking at that, uh, what happens when you disaggregate the small theater from the large theater, just in terms of profitability? Well, uh, it, it's hard to do that, but I'll explain why. Because the the way that it uh, works is that we'll bring in a new movie to the big screen, and then when it starts to slow down, we will move it to the smaller screen. That's usually the way it works. Um, what we're fine, and what that allows us to do is to bring in another movie faster to the big screen. So it used to be that everything had to play on the big screen, and when it would start to peter out, and the studio would say, "Well, no, you have to keep it another week. We think it's making enough money." We were just dying, waiting to try and you know. Um, get a new movie in. But now we can say, yeah, okay, and we punch it over to the smaller screen and then that allows us to talk to a different studio and bring in a different film. So it's hard to say how much money one screen makes over the other because they work in tandem. Um, one of the things that we're finding is that uh, I think it's a, it's a marketing issue and we need to spend more money on marketing. This is, again, a chicken and egg. We don't have the money, but we need to spend the money to, to make the money. There's a, still a misperception that the screening room is the pop-up and so people say oh I don't want to be in there I was in there and you know it was I didn't think it was terrible but um there are people that didn't like it and they don't realize it has been fully renovated and it's the same same thank you it's very comfortable seats they actually are more padded than the ones in the main auditorium yeah that um it's the same sound system it's you know it's a beautiful projection so yeah so I think we still are finding some people who don't don't want to come to screenings that are in the smaller space just looking back at that graph again, so isn't the the movie movie releases aren't they sort of cyclical? Like when the Oscars are there, then yes. in the summer things slow down. So it's kind of this is a long uh, kind of uh, uh, this is an arc. 
Right, that's like year by year. year by but year, there is right. a, we it's are in the slump point. now, right? The post yes. Oscar slump. Yes, yeah. The, our best months historically have been basically November to February because that's all the movies that are coming out that are trying to get Oscar buzz. And then all the movies that we weren't able to show during that period roll over into January, February, and then we show the winner again. And so that's our best, best time of year. Um, and we, we are getting, you know, February, we were at about two thirds of where we were in 2018. So again, we, we're, we're climbing out. Um, but this is a slump that we tend to hit. Um, yeah, there are a lot of what's called temple movies that happen in the summer. We don't tend to show those, but we're, we're trying them. So, you know, we'll show Ghostbusters or we'll show other things that are more sort of on the edge of what we would normally show. And, and there it's, it's not the answer, unfortunately, like there, I think, um, our regular patrons that's not the film that they want to see and then trying to lure other people away is sometimes hard. But, I mean what what you know we haven't had a chance to talk about at all is the thing that's unique to the Greenbelt cinema which is the movies and conversations that we've had so I don't know if anybody was able to attend the screening of Tower Road and talking about Prince George's County Public School but like I'm a PGCPS teacher I brought teachers from my high school retired like members of, like we have and it was a fan and it was hard to get people to leave because it was such a great conversation and that's the kind of thing that is really hard to quantify but that's that's what makes it yes that's, and that's what we want to do more of exactly and that's <laughs> the problem is that we are kind of at this crossroads where if we were to just follow the numbers those are the things that we would cut because they don't make money but they're in integral to so story time the, the free films for seniors the free films for kids those don't make money but they're they're at the core of what we want to do. They're exactly, I mean, if we only were to chase dollars, we would very quickly be back in the model that Paul Sanchez operated under where it's a for-profit and it's not open that often and it's just showing things until they completely peter out and nobody likes that model. So, you know, we don't want to go back to that. So it's, it's, a, it's about finding that balance of how do we support the programming that really does create that sense of community. I mean, we found that when we first came out of the pandemic is we weren't encouraging people we, we didn't have special events like that. So we were basically just a multiplex, but with one screen and people, and we had social distancing and people just, they missed it. They wanted that. They wanted that connection, that extra. Yeah, exactly. The conversation. So, um, this is the, um, the very useful, um, calculator from Americans for the arts, which helps to actually quantify the impact of an arts organization in your community. So you put in how many people live in your city or town, the number of tickets that you've sold and the size of your budget. And it spits out these calculations, which is wonderful to see that how much we're actually generating for, Greenbelt and the surrounding area, you know, that this is not just a, we, we are a nonprofit, but we're not a charity case in that way. Like we do contribute back into the community. I mean, we have, you know, 15 employees who are all currently Greenbelt residents. Um, and then the knock on effect of the other businesses that are supported by people that go out to dinner or they go over to the co-op to grab some groceries or they decide to go, you know, use the credit union as their bank. Like it all feeds into the local economy. And we know that we have a really important impact, especially in Roosevelt Center because of the depressive effect of when we were closed in 2019. Well, in 2014, 15, both of the major renovations that, that caused us to, to really pull back our operations really affected the other businesses. And they would say like, when are you going to reopen? Even during COVID, Beijing was like, you know, please, you need to get back open because you bring so many people into the area. So Hey, we, we do have that uh, that good news that uh, that we shared about the yes. uh, the bond request that mm -hmm. our uh, state delegates and senator uh, were able to uh, fulfill. That I guess that'll be coming at some point. Uh, will the theater need to, to close uh, for a period of time in order to accomplish those those uh, upgrades? <laughs> well, hopefully not. I mean, there may be short closures. There there are. Um, there's nothing in there that Something about the stage, right? Uh, yes, but I think that um, there are ways in which we we talked about that we could make it safe to that work would happen during early in the day, and then we could you know secure the area so that people could still come in at night. We we could probably fabricate some of the stage off site and bring it in sections. <laughs> um, so I banner up with a picture of the the new stage. <laughs> exactly, <of> the <laughs> little peep through holes. Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, so yes, so then so if oh. bond funding, when does that usually, when will we actually get the check? Well, we're anticipating that that will be an FY 2025, uh, receipt. 
um, and we'll ex- ex- expect to uh, start spending that in 2025. So that's an adjustment that you're going to see in the budget um, once it comes to you for final approval, because at the time we put the budget together, we did not have those news. Now we do. Um, so we expect to get the money in 2025 as part of the 2025 appropriations, but we not, may not spend it all in 25. So, and I think we'll, we'll need to work through a lot of the projects. There'll be some things that can be easily rolled out, like the screens that we're proposing to put in the lobby area. The, the bathroom's probably going to be more involved because it's a more involved project. Windows are probably going to go much faster. Uh, it it depends on the on the particular uh, projects we're placing. And the HVAC system, there was something in there with the HVAC too, right? We initially started with that because the 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 study that was done on the on the building included HVAC, but that had been upgraded. Huh? So we included other elements that the cinema needs. Okay. So lights, yeah. uh, some carpet work, some flooring work. It's really a big deal. stage. <laughs> we had looked at an AV equipment. Now all our full funding request was not funded, yeah. uh, so we're going to be be speaking with the team about what needs to come out. Um, I particularly was excited that we had included a, a, a coffee bar set up, espresso machine, but that may need to come out of the... We'll see. The we'll see what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, <laughs> the lighting or something, so when you're having a uh, panel yes. discussion on the stage, you'll yes. be able to kind of yes. uh, make it a little bit easier to see. And, Absolutely. That, that, it, it's, you know, a, it, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. It is. Yeah. And, a, and better microphones and yes. Microphones, yes, that yes. was part of the AV yeah. uh, okay. equipment upgrades. And, and the roof's not leaking, is it? No, no. Okay. Oh. It, you know, it's it's a flat roof. You know that, right? Let's talk about that. <laughs> Don't chase it. <laughs> oh my. So we have a question, Mr. Hartman, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, calling me. Um, I have another commitment I need to get to, and I really wanted to say something. Um, I um, first of all, I want to thank um, Caitlin and, and uh, Kathy for running a wonderful operation. Uh, she's exactly right that um, we at, at the cafe have have benefited from the movie theater people coming in before or after to go to dinner and stuff. And um, also, I wanted to say that I uh, give them um, testimony about um, the fact that uh, Caitlin is a very, very, very open to a lot of community things. Uh, right now we're working with her t- uh, f- for the uh, Pride Parade on June 15th and, and she's trying very, very hard to fit everything in and everything and, and we really appreciate that. Uh, also in terms of accessibility, um, when the theater was originally um, renovated, um, Kaylin was very uh, instrumental in reaching out to the disability community. I remember we got together a group of people with disabilities who work with the architects and planners, and we moved lines from here to there. And uh, I just want to say that she has been very, very uh, supportive of these kinds of community things that, that she's correct. Other movie theaters that are for-profit don't do those things. And and I think that that um, one of the things that I've noticed is that the three entertainment units in Roosevelt Center, uh, Greenbelt Arts Center, the theater, and the cafe, all bring in people from outside of Greenbelt in the region. And I think that uh, there's three very strong anchors, well, not strong maybe, but uh, three <laughs> anchors that bring people in from out of town in the region and the state. And people come from all over to come to either the theater or GAC or the cafe. And I just want to um, say my appreciation for the theater uh, before I had to get out of here, but thank you very much for that. Thank you, Mike. Yes, please. Thank you. Now I'm thinking out loud. I mean, I'm just thinking to myself, so I'm gonna think out loud and we're gonna, gonna voice what I think. This is very good, six-year budget overview, very nicely put together. I don't know about those lines. I did not couldn't follow those lines, but I can definitely follow this. So my question is to you, and that was one of the questions. You have 15 employees, because <clears throat> I see the uh, it, payroll is at 357309. So you mentioned you have 15 employees. How many employees are part-time, and how many employees are full-time? 
We have five FTE, uh, and then the rest are part-time. So that's 10 part-time and... Yes, and that, that fluctuates, you know, the part-time employees are the high school and college students that work down front, so sometimes it's eight, some, you know. It's... So these five FTEs, <clears throat> is there one that's, a, that's just dedicated to marketing? No, we currently, we lost our marketing person during the pandemic. They moved on to start their own um, uh, consulting business. And so we, since then, since mid-pandemic, have not had a person who is dedicated to marketing. We do have somebody on staff whose job it is, but it's not the only hat that she wears. Do you plan on in the future having a full-time marketing? Job? Very much so. I would love to be able to do that. It's just, again, a question of funding. Right, because you did mention you have to spend money to make money, and you do. So looking at the... Uh, line item advertising that that was a jump from forty eight hundred to eight thousand five hundred and thirty two dollars um so so that's income that's advertising income that we have on screen that's not our marketing budget that's just a re revenue stream for us how, how we, we have a number of non-taxable revenue streams and advertising is selling advertising is one of them like merchant like when we're we're doing like the donation rentals that's another one that we look at yeah so, okay. All right. Those are all, uh, that's under, it's, it's under, under income. income. Yeah. If you look at the line number five mm -hmm. is income, and then those are subcategories of income. All right. Yeah. But you are $145,357 in the red? Uh, well, that's how much we lost. We don't carry debt. So we had a, a lot of COVID support, you know, um, relief funding, and that was a large pot of money that, out of that, we we used 145. When we made the decision, I talked about the difficult decision to when to reopen to seven days. Part of that was looking at how much cushion we had from the COVID support and planning out that we could afford to spend a year or more operating at a net loss. I mean, we're a nonprofit, so we're not right, trying to right. make a profit. We just want to stay roughly even. But we figured we could operate at a loss for okay. a period of time because of the cushion that we have. Two thoughts before I lose my train of thought. So uh, five FTAs and 10. Have you ever thought about interns, maybe high school students? We currently have an intern from the University of Maryland. Okay, you might want to up that. I'm, I'm just is just thinking out loud, and then for the total grants, one hundred thirteen thousand fifty five. That's how many. That's how much money you got from grants. Is that? I do, just hang on on the on the the front of house staff, the part time employees. We do pay um, a living wage for that. We don't undercut our high school. We don't like say, well, you're a high school student, you don't have a family to feed, so we can get away with yeah. free or cheap labor. No. Um, the out. What's the hourly rate roughly, Caitlin? It's. it's Starts at 50, like yeah. 1575. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Good, yeah. Good, and that's good. for the intern as well. They're also paid. They are. I'm sorry, paid. what? The, the intern is also paid. Just, oh, that's I want, a, okay. So it's not a free source of labor. I oh, okay. So you did receive $113,055 in grants, right? For 2023? Because that's a, that's a difference between 169. And I understand COVID. I get it. But you might want to aggressively look for that as well. So... I, I, this is just thinking out loud. Like, I have all the answers I don't. But just looking at this, uh, this is just what comes to mind. And I hope that's the only thing that comes to my mind. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how, how much uh, of the ARPA assistance did, did, uh, were you able to, to secure? From the city of Greenbelt? Uh, it will wind up being a total of 50000 it's uh, over the years, not just one yes. Year. Okay, were you able to uh, obtain any additional support from the federal government? Absolutely, we were part of um, the. Um, oh, no, I'm gonna thank you, SMOC. <laughs> I was thinking MD Siri, but that was another one. Um, yeah, the the Shuttered Venues Operator Grant that was for live and live theater and movie theaters, and we benefited from that immensely. I mean, that's where um, you know a lot of this, the, the bigger numbers in 2020 and 2021 come from that. So I, I want you to kind of work through the rest of this. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry, you know, it's, I was hoping that they actually be, uh, you know, if we don't wrap up by 10 o'clock, uh, the city council is going to beat me up in the That's parking fine. lot. I can talk really quickly. So we can skip this next slide. Let's just, that was one that we'd done previously. I wanted to compare, but it, it's fine. Um, I just had this 
slide because I wanted to show that we are very lucky that we have had the partnership with the city. You know, this is something new that's happening that communities are, are you know, it's it's celebrities and, and community um, members and, and, and groups that are saving historic theaters. And you all did that 25 years ago. So kudos to you and thank you. Um, the next slide is, so I wanted to just, um, revisit this um, in terms of our stipend because as I said the the 50,000 is something that's that was um, a carryover from the for-profit operation that's what Paul Sanchez was getting per year it started in around the year 2000 when you all purchased the theater and um, in 2018 this is the last budget presentation where we broke this down that worked out when we had about 40,000 people to a dollar 25 per visitor in subsidy and I just wanted to compare that to the two other arts organizations that are you know comparable that receive city support so at the time that for the art center um, was twelve dollars a visitor and the Greenbelt Museum was 26 and if you scroll down um, I have updated this with the most recent last year's budget numbers, and you can see that Greenville Art Center went up to forty three thousand. Then they obviously, you know, suffered as we did during the pandemic. But that means that the the per visitor subsidy was two hundred and fifteen, and for the Greenbelt Museum, it was one hundred and sixteen. So um, what we are requesting is to adjust for inflation, something that's never been done. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see that the um, the proposed increase is if we were to adjust just for inflation, that fifty thousand from two thousand dollars become uh, twenty. Sorry, from the the year two thousand becomes in twenty twenty four ninety one thousand, and we um, that would help. Um, but again, as I said, if we look back on what the city was getting for the 50,000, you all weren't really happy. And that's where we came in as a nonprofit to say we could do a lot more. That's where it was dark a lot of the time. There wasn't any community involvement. There was no Grinch for Christmas. There was no Halloween parade there. All of that, you know, you know, we have added. And so, um, we think currently with 150,000, again, that, that per visitor subsidy is still orders of magnitude lower than other arts organizations in Greenbelt. So it is quite a, a low cost and it would make, make a huge difference in our ability to recover in this year. Our goal, as Kathy said, we are not looking to make money. That's not what we do as a nonprofit. We're just trying to break even. We're trying to be able to keep doing what we love doing and what we think the community loves us to do. And so the goal is to help us get out of this trough where if we can spend some more money on marketing, if we can do a little bit more outreach, if we can, you know, um, put on a few more programs to reach people and other, um, you know, field trips for school kids that are outside of Greenbelt and uh, educational workshops for kids that are beyond just Greenbelt residents, then we'll be able to um, recover more quickly and then revisit that number. You know, we are not... Um, if, if at the end of, you know, from a year or two or three years from now, we no longer need that 150, then of course, let's reduce it back down. Like, again, the, the goal is not for us to just get more support that we are not going to put to use. We make very good use of every dollar that we get from Greenbelt. Um, as you can see, you know, uh, when we were doing it at just 83 cents per visitor, I think that's, that's um, a great value to um, Greenbelt residents and to city council. So, um, that's that's our our closing um, point, and I'll just scroll down. I wanted to leave you with a few of these images that we had of where we used our marquee to try and you know boost people's spirits, and you know um, you all have had the foresight to save the cinema from becoming a dollar store or a bowling alley, and we're at one of these critical juncture moments again, where we have we're doing everything we possibly can, and we just are at the limits of what we can do on our own. Well, Thank certainly, you. you know, the impact of the uh, the cinema to uh, Roosevelt Center and the city of Greenbelt really can't be quantified. Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, it is so uh, critical to, to, to have to be working with, with a nonprofit organization is, you know, the emphasis can really be placed not just looking at the numbers, but looking at the uh, impact to mm -hmm. young people. Mm -hmm together as only <laughs> cinema can possibly do. I have to, I don't want to quibble with any of the numbers, but you know, I think when you talk about the museum, uh, I, part, you know, the capital costs that are involved in, in building the sure. addition and just, you know, kind of skews the, when you're talking operating and capital and, and because of the unique arrangement with the, uh, 
the theater where we actually own the building. So we, we were taking care of the capital and your operating is, is a little different. And I guess the Arts Center is a different story as well. So. Right. There is no one-to-one, -one. absolutely. And well, this is something that I had talked to, um, you know, a few of you about and in, uh, in conversation with Greg Varda because he is our liaison to the city. And so um, he brought up the, the possibility of did, were we interested in doing something along with what the museum had done of coming under the umbrella for the Recreation Department. And, of course, that's something that would take a lot of thought and meetings and work sessions and planning and thinking about what would be best for the city and for the cinema. Um, but one of the, the major stumbling blocks that I see to that is that you can see that when you have somebody on staff, as Megan is, very rightly so, appropriately, I'm, I'm not at all questioning that, but it does increase the, the overall budget. And so my understanding is that for every one of those FTE employees that we're talking about, um, if we were to bring them on board as a city employee, then that is an additional thirty to forty thousand dollars a year in their benefits package. So just right there, we're looking at one hundred and eighty to two forty because we're we're looking to add one more full time person. So that that's a really big number. So in terms of the impact on the city's budget, it may be something that we want to continue to explore, and I'm happy to have those conversations and 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 you know um, look at the pros and cons all on all sides. Um, but what we think right now would be most instrumental is just an increase in the subsidy that would allow us to keep doing what we're doing independently. You know, as I say, all the things that we're doing right now to um, try and draw more folks in, we'll be able to do more of that. We are working with our angel donors who are um, interested in setting up a endowment for us. And so we're in conversation with them and the Greater uh, Washington Community Foundation about how to set that up. So that will also come into effect. It's just... It takes time, and it's and it's not going to happen immediately. And they'll seed it, but then we need to once it's seeded, then we can let people know that they can also, you know, um, contribute, and then that will continue to grow. But we're just in this we're in this crunch period right now. Yeah, as as a nonprofit, uh, you know, setting up an endowment or just you're kind of in the position where you could actually obtain some larger uh, capital uh, right. grants from large foundations mm -hmm. that are interested in, in yeah. media. Uh, Let's see, uh, Council Member Pompey, you have a question, uh, but I, I did want you to talk uh, a little bit about your board and introduce your board and right. tell us about everybody who's here and everybody. Right. So um, we have Kathy Jones with us, who is the chair of the board. Um, we also have with us Connie Barber, who is our um, treasurer, and Stacia Wojcik, who is our um, secretary. You have other members of the board as well? We do. We do. They're just not in attendance tonight. Um, I just wanted to say, um, in reviewing your your budget, my my first career was as a nonprofit fundraiser, and I really have to say that seeing where you've come since, seeing how far you've come since twenty twenty, that's just incredibly impressive. I mean, honestly, the year over year gains that you guys have made since reopening post pandemic, like you should be so proud of that. I mean, when you say you are using our money wisely, I see that here, you know, like I, I can see that. And I, I mean, that's, I don't, I don't even know what I mean. I was just couldn't even believe it. I was like, <laughs> I can't believe like how much, even from 2022 to 2023, like leaps, you know? And, and I think that's just, a sign of you got that what you're doing is you're doing something right. I think that, you know, you're pulling people in. I have seen myself the increase in your social media and your advertisement. And like my husband and I just had a conversation last week and it was like, you know, before, before we had kids, we went to the movies all the time. Right. We all did. <laughs> and then our kids were small and we never went to the movies. And then our kids were finally old enough where we could go to the movies again. And then the pandemic hit. And I was like, and this year we were like, we want to get back to going to the movies. Like we like doing that. So we've been coming, we've been going a lot and we're bringing Thank the kids. Thank like, you. Because we want them to sort of have that, I don't know, that that piece of childhood that we had yes. of going to the movies. And I have a very soft spot for um, Greenbelt Cinema because when I was in college, I could come here and see a movie for five bucks. Yes. <laughs> which was incredible. When right. you're broke and yeah. can't do anything, you could just come and watch a movie in the really super cool, cold air conditioning right, right, right. for $5. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> all that aside, I just wanted to say that I, I'm very impressed with your numbers. I think that you guys are doing a lot of great stuff and um, 
yeah, thank you so much for all the, all the hard work you're doing and everything you're bringing to our city. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you seeing the hustle in the numbers yeah. there because it, it has, it's been, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Orleans, do you have a question? Thank you. Uh, I'll certainly agree that in any, under any circumstances, uh, preservation of the Greenbelt Theater, I prefer to call it than the cinema, but preservation of the Greenbelt Theater is an important element to the city and council should do what's necessary to ensure that. Uh, the column, these, I guess it's page 22, the six year budget overview. The column under income, I presume is inclusive of all sources of income. Uh, the column uh, under expenses uh, reveal only two expenses, <laughs> uh, a steadily growing payroll, which may or not, may not be appropriate, I don't know, uh, and a variation of rents. Uh, and I presume that's the rent for the pop-up or the, now the- Second screen, the screening room, yeah. Yeah, the screening room. Uh, the theater certainly doesn't pay rent to the city of Greenbelt because the city of Greenbelt wants you to operate in the Greenbelt theater. Uh, but the pop-up or the screening room is rent to Mr. Christakos. And I don't think Greenbelt should be paying Mr. Christakos anything. And I don't think Greenbelt should have any of its commercial tenants in Roosevelt Center pay Mr. Christakos anything. I think Greenbelt should own Roosevelt Center itself. Uh, but that's a separate question. Uh, the, that's, that's above my pay grade. The rental expenses since 2019 for the now screening room uh, vary uh, in, in each of these five years, it's under 10%, except one year when it's over 10%. Uh, I don't understand the reason for the varying resent rents. Maybe Mr. Krasakos or his family. Uh, it's to do with real estate taxes. We pay the real estate tax, so that's the variation. Well, that's another thing. Uh, Greenbelt commercial tenants should not be paying real estate taxes for whomever owns their, theoretically owns the property that they're leasing. In any event, uh, I think the expenses, frankly, should be in full, completely outlined here. And uh, Greenbelt should do what's necessary both to ensure the preservation of Greenbelt Theater, but also to ensure assure that uh, the Greenbelt Theater no longer has to pay rent and the real estate taxes <laughs> to Mr. Christopher. Ms. Jones? Well, I'd like to echo that. I actually agree with you on that on Dell. So you're... So your rent, you're paying rent, and you're also paying real estate taxes as well. Yes. Well, that's crazy. I agree with you, Bill. Yeah, and yes, you guys do. You have a lot of hustle there. I agree, but I like to see more hustle in your total grants as well. But that is absolutely crazy to me that you're paying rent and you're paying real estate taxes. That's like me going out renting an apartment and paying real estate ta taxes on top of the rent. That's, this doesn't make sense. And I do agree with, with Bill on one other thing, too. We should own, Greenbelt should own Greenbelt Center as well, not Mr. Whatever His Name Is. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in terms of the, uh, if you don't mind, the, the lease with Mr. Christakos, I'm sorry. I had a quick question, um, because I, I love the cinema very much so, and I want to see it succeed, but I do have a harder question to ask, because we did just talk to CARES, and we're debating whether or not to keep a community nurse at $20,000 for six months. So if we're not able to accommodate the $100,000 increase, what is the future for the cinema? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be some hard decisions that we have to make. And like I said, we don't want to be fully um, driven by the dollar, but we will have to look hard at what kinds of things we might have to cut back on. Um, it's, uh, we, we really can't drive our expenses any lower. Um, we've done everything we can to bring that down. And the only thing that we could do is ask people to do more, uh, which I, I actually can't imagine doing that of staff. I mean, and we, what we would have to do, the, the only other way that we could cut costs. And that's why those are the, the two major items there is because payroll is, of course, the biggest number. Um, and I don't know how we could do what we do with fewer staff members. Uh, now, if you look back at what um, 
what, what Paul Sanchez was doing, he didn't have any full-time staff there. He had a teenager who would go in at night and open it and, you know, maybe one other person on the weekends. And we have a much bigger staff because we do a lot more. So I, it, it is a tough question because it's something that I, you know, when I proposed this idea, could not have anticipated the pandemic the shifting of the industry, the rise of streaming, all these things that have just changed the landscape fundamentally of how this um, industry works. And I was talking earlier about the leap of faith that we took, that if we reopen seven days a week, then people will come back and we will see the um, the kind of attendance numbers and the the participation from the community that would allow us to get to no city subsidy, which is part of where we're aiming to be self-sufficient, which was part of the point of opening the second screen. And not having an increase means we definitely cannot afford to hire anybody to do marketing, and marketing is part of how we get back to normal even what do that e does that even mean? But I mean, we're not going to get to a point of self-sufficiency until we are able to reach out to people beyond the community and deal with a lot of the, um, the communication that needs to be done to educate the larger community and then people who have fallen like, to get back to where we are. And we can't do that unless we have the seed money to do that. So that's, it means a much slower, hopefully positive at least, climb back, but I don't know how long that will take and I don't know how long the cushion will last. And I would say just as um, to address your point about the staff member for CARES, my, uh, I would imagine that that is something that if it um, gets put into place, then it would continue year after year after year because you want to keep that person in that position. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying we think we need an increase right now. We hope to be able to bring that right back down the next time we talk. I can't say how much because I the pandemic has taught me to not um, make predictions of that sort. So I, it's not that we're saying we want this amount in this year's budget and we want that same amount next year and then it's probably going to increase. The, the goal is with a, an influx right now that that'll help us, it'll, it'll be the catalyst that'll allow us to then, once the engine's running, we can do it on our own and then we, we'll be able to set that aside. And last time Caitlin and I were here, I was really clear that without the $50,000 that we had from the city, we could not have stayed open during the pandemic. Fill in the blank. I had a quick question about your fixed costs just in terms of the relationship with the, with the small theater. Uh, so you have an agreement, uh, it's a lease, and so is it for five years or 10 years? No, it's it's 20 at least. They wanted to give us like 100 years, and I said, and I thought 20 was good, but yeah, it's a long time. Fixed cost. Uh, yes, there is a there is a built in three percent increase that happens every certain, I don't, I don't remember the exact deal, but there is a, uh, so, uh, yes and yes for the rent yeah okay okay and uh let's see oh and just uh looking at the uh, six-year projection so one thing that took a little bit of a dip is the advertising so uh, how come what is that it's mostly the ads that play on screen so when we didn't have so there's a you can see that in 2020 it looks like we were doing pretty well but that's because there's a delay so we play an ad and then sometimes it's months later half a year or more before that revenue comes in so it still looks like it's pretty good when we were closed but then you can see it absolutely bottoms out in 2021 when there was no screen there were no ads on screen so it's it's simply a function of that and that was another thing that when we weren't open seven days a week then that revenue is dropped because we get paid per showing of that how, how much is that? Uh, uh, are they in like five second, 10? Because I, I want one of those subliminal ads for myself where it blips on for like one <laughs> second. Both <laughs> tournament. We, <laughs> we. Kidding aside though, how, how much uh, is it for? How much runtime are they? Yes. It for, can be as short as 15 seconds. It can be as much as a minute. Um, every ad is different. Every amount of our, the sort of share that we get is different. So, and what's the going rate for uh, one of those? Oh, it can Just be. It can be what, what the midpoint, perhaps. Two hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars for an ads run for a week. Sometimes that can be two weeks. It's very. It's really variable. I'm afraid. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Porter. I wanted to ask about um, the, uh, the the beer and wine sales. When what when 
because that was at some point last year. So some of the 2023 numbers include that, doesn't it? Or was it at the, yeah. so none of that's included in this? No, but it's, okay. it's soft right now. So we, um, in, the, in the first two months, we made $500. So it's not a huge okay. amount. It's, it's not nothing. Um, but that's another thing that we think with, with a little bit more money toward marketing that we can bring that up. And some of it's word of mouth. You know, people don't, we, we can say that we have beer and wine, but it's not until you come and you go, oh, <laughs> is that a beer? Can I get that? That people... But if yeah, if it's five hundred so far out of a almost eighty one thousand concessions budget, that's not it's not that's not making as much difference as as it's it's more people who got used to the idea that they could go and go to the movie and have a glass of wine. We want Greenbelt Cinema to be an option for them as well. So it's 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 a it's a knock on effect that as more people know when they're looking and saying, well, I could see you know Dune at the AFI and get a and wine and it's maybe a fourteen dollar ticket at Greenbelt. The ticket's only nine dollars, but I can't get the wine. They're going to spend more on that ticket because they want to be able to have that drink. So that's the we're hoping to be able to be up there with the the other folks. Are you partnering with the uh, food co-op on that, just in terms of your, your source of uh, beer? Oh, no, um, the liquor license requires that we get it through a distributor. We can't get it from the co-op. Councilmember McKinney. Uh, you mentioned that you're bringing on a marketing uh, consultant. I'm wondering if they're taking a look m not just at marketing, but more of a fundraising sort of campaign, because I was just looking at your memberships and things like that, and I'm just wondering in the breakdown of your memberships, how many of those are, you know, the smaller membership dues, how many of those are large? Have you broken that down to see where you might be able to get traction across different membership types? Yes, so she is not um, a fundraising professional, so she's not the person to do it, but we are doing it internally. Um, this the switch over to the new system, one of the things that's beneficial about it is that it allows people to break out their membership by month. So let's say you want to, you know, you could have a $50 membership as an adult, or maybe you'd make the leap up to one of those higher sustaining levels if you could break it out month by month. Month. And so you'll see our membership campaign this spring is going to really focus on that. So that's our hope that we'll be able to draw more people back that way. Gosh, uh, how much do you say those uh, memberships were? It's just $50. $50, that's yeah. all? <laughs> yeah. you, you can do that too, yeah, but on a monthly basis, it's, yeah. $500 and you get a free popcorn with every food. Well, there you go, Emmett. <laughs> 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 this has really been uh, very enlightening being able to sit and uh, talk with you in the context of a, uh, a budget session or a work session. We just really haven't sat down and done this in a while. Yes, so we appreciate the really opportunity. Helpful. Thank you. So, it's been a while. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good to be back. <laughs> Any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate all Thank you. Time. I know it's past 10, but I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you for uh, changing the marquee for us for today for the yes visit wasn't that the nice yes Center. i'm so glad we could do that yeah that was our pleasure well that's something that you know as a community resource we're more than happy to jump up the ladder and do that thank you so much Thanks. thank you okay we got a couple information items what do you got mayor pro tem weaver yeah so i'll be quick uh one thing that i wanted to mention was the the um, nlc transportation and infrastructure services committee um I mean, they were still, again, pushing the safe streets and roads for all. Um, and they mentioned that they have multiple deadlines for the planning grants so that you can actually get feedback and resubmit and really emphasize the idea of getting that in early because then if you don't make the first cut, you have a chance to resubmit. Um, yeah, the first, first deadline's like in a couple, couple of weeks, weeks, isn't it? Uh, I didn't write down the deadlines, yeah, actually, because I was really trying to, I was doing this, I was actually listening in on the call on, um, partially on the way back from the airport on Wednesday, um, I think, no, I was doing something else, I don't remember, anyway, I was trying to do it on the go. Um, there was, a, there's also, uh, an active transportation program, uh, infrastructure investment program, I don't know, I can send that link and see if that's one that's on our list. Uh, the next EV charging and fueling grant application will open up in May. I know that's one that we have been paying attention to, but that the next round of that will be in May. They also had an interesting presentation about a civic mapping initiative. So they're mapping transit access to Head Start locations and community college campuses. Um, and so this is a project of NLC, um, and it's not it's it's in a beta form and not public yet. But they can build a fact sheet looking at that base for specific cities. So if that's something that we would be interested to have, I can reach out to the NLC contact about that to see if that's something that we were interested in. And there all there were um, so I, I'm not sure exactly they didn't give an example of what the fact sheet was, but basically they they map um, how close community colleges and head start, like whether there is a transit stop 
within 0.2 miles, I think it was 0.2 to, I don't remember what it was, one and a half or something. And then, you know, different, different distances and how close uh, there are transit stops. Um, and the idea is to help inform, inform policy and changes in that. Uh, you know, I know we don't have any actual community colleges in Greenbelt, but it's, that could be something. And that actually could be, a, I could, we can maybe mention that to Four Cities and or PGCMA um, might be useful there. Um, yeah, so I think those were the, the, the things that I, but I can send the links. Um, the other thing I just wanted to talk briefly about was trying to juggle the multiple events we have on Saturday. Um, so it's uh, it, it, the, the, because we, I think the there's the Earth Day event starting at 10. There's the Greenbelt Youth uh, Baseball Little League Parade starting at 10. There's the um, the District 22 Legislative Recap at, I think it's a, being held at Luminous yeah. at Doctors Hospital at 10.30. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Greenbelt Orchestra that starts at, uh, orchestra concert that starts at uh, 11. So I think is the plan, I mean, I, we, I, I, I guess I'm not sure that we can smoothly be at all of them, but is the plan to try to do the proclamation, you know, early enough at Buddy Attic that then we can go to part of the parade and then no, throw that, out the pitch and then just want to see what the plan is here. That, that, that's my thought. thought. I, I, I think that we can, uh, if we do the uh, Earth Day proclamation and kick things off expeditiously at 10, uh, I think while we might uh, miss the very beginning of the parade, uh, I do want to be there to uh, you know throw out the uh, first pitch so uh, my, my thinking is that, you know, definitely be at Earth Day. I, I think that we can make it over to Little League if some council members want to go for the beginning of the parade. But, you know, the parade, uh, everybody sort of gathers and they talk and the fire department's there and they go over. So generally speaking, that the, and Ms. Pope, uh, you, you, you know, and Mr. Roberts, uh, you know, that usually doesn't really start. You know, it takes about 45 minutes. So, Does it not, okay, because we have enough time to go to the proclamation on where are we meeting? Earth Day. At Earth, Day. Earth Day is at Buddy Attic. Buddy Attic, Buddy on the other side this right. time, right? right? So then we do that, but we just have to be very punctual, and then we're going to go on, or I plan on going to the uh, baseball. Yeah, yeah. and, I, I and after that, last year, I yeah. go. and I can arrange transportation to move folks that would from be the attic to the parade. We could have like our <laughs> secret service. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Up in a, <laughs> and SUV. Yeah, and yeah I was going to say the great, the great logo around. on the side. That actually would be helpful, though, because well, it's it not hard be, to find there's parking. There's not going to be any parking over there. Yeah. So that actually would be helpful. I mean, it's... So, and with the uh, legislative uh, update over at Doctors Hospital, that those tend to go a little bit longer. So per personally, I was going to do Earth Day, uh, baseball, maybe make it over to the doctors and if not kind of go back to help out at earth earth day a little bit more uh so if some count if you want to spread this out that's great you know i'm probably gonna do the proclamation mm -hmm. and then the pitch and then go to the concert if that have times to do that that's kind okay. of my plan because we usually do the great ball democratic club usually does a Legislative wrap up in May. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. I. So there may be another opportunity so, to hear. Yeah. From so me. if I'm missing, yeah, if I'm yeah. miss, so I feel like I don't need to hear it two times. Yeah, so. Frankly, you know, the uh, our, our delegation, it'd be nice if they would kind of pop into a council meeting or something and give us a quick update, because you know, it's nice to hear from the state delegation. Half of them live here. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no so hopefully we can, but I think transportation might that would, really might, would facilitate yeah, like the things. Van or if so we will. I will arrange to have a vehicle, the van, a minimum the van, so that would transport six. Uh, that means I'm going to have to if, work on my spitball a little bit because that that opening day pitch, you know. Oh, oh I was uh, practicing. I went. I I, I I was I was practicing my throwing on 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 uh, Sunday morning with my husband. Uh oh. Uh oh. So. So with the I have to not embarrass that, myself. We would, we would meet at, <laughs> at Earth Day. Buddy Earth, Attic. Buddy Where is the what, at which entrance is Earth Day? I think we'll be over the main entrance. The main entrance. The the main entrance. Okay. Yeah. Just trying to figure mm -hmm. out because. Yeah, you know, thank you so much. Thank you. So for the vehicle, we can talk offline, but we can meet you here at the municipal building and drive there, and then drive back wherever the final destination is, where we could just pick you up at Buddy Attic I'm if you're. Right. I'm going to yeah. walk over you there, and then I'll take there. a ride to the baseball, and yeah. then I can walk home from there. Okay, yeah. excellent. Get your steps in. And I'll be 
be okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just let me know the pickup point, and I'll be. Yep. There. So okay. it sounds like uh, picking up a buddy attic would be good. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. We're gonna be like. That's right. Talk sharp. Hey, well, thank you, everybody. It's been a, a really productive uh, work session, really interesting, good information sharing. Appreciate the uh, council and staff for all of your good work. So let's call on the night. Thank you. Yeah, good thank night. You. Good to see you. Yeah. Yes. You know, you know if one of these pictures was sent to Carla? Dinner? No. Well, I don't know. It should have been. Nice. Oh, it would be the, nice. That's what I asked again. Stuff. Yeah, maybe just send her a copy of it. That's a special picture. That's a good picture. Yeah. This one on the, uh, the call this morning. Yeah, yeah. It sounded I like our... Uh, upping, assuring that there's an appropriate percentage, a number of full time. Absolutely. And I don't disagree with you. Now that's important to me. You wait till that comes up. You wait till that comes up. You think it's going to come up. I'll, I'll be here and I look forward to hearing you from you. <laughs>